Uh, calling the meeting of the Amherst uh, School Committee to order. And this is also a uh, joint meeting with our Amherst Town Council. So President Griesmer. And at this point, we will call the meeting of the Town Council to order. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight and uh, to our Town Council for being here with us uh, to hear this very important report. Uh, just for those watching at home, this meeting is being recorded and live broadcast by Amherst Media. I've also been asked to announce uh, that we have a new minute taker. Welcome, Cielo. And uh, to ask committee members and counselors to please identify yourselves when speaking for the benefit of the minutes, if you don't mind. Um, so the first order of business, I'm actually going to ask that we uh, move the approval of minutes of August 20th to, um, with the school committee's permission, to the actual school committee, school committee meeting after the town council adjourns. I see nodding heads. Okay, thank you very much. So that'll allow us to move into the Fort River Feasibility Study Report, which I think is sort of the uh, main reason why many folks are here tonight, especially in our audience. Uh, I want to thank um, the, uh, the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee uh, Chair and uh, our architects from TSKP for being here tonight. Uh, I also just want to make a, a quick rearrangement of our uh, agenda for tonight as well. We have currently listed that we would have public comment uh, at the, as a first item under the Amherst School Committee and understanding how important this topic is for a lot of community members in particular, but also to give an opportunity for the Feasibility Study Building Committee to speak if they would so like. I would like to offer a brief public comment period on the item after the presentation and after the committee and the council have had an opportunity to uh, ask their questions and have a discussion if that is okay with the town council and with our school committee. That is acceptable to the town council, thank you. Thank you. And I see nodding heads in our school committee. So we will have a brief uh, public comment period immediately after. So with that, um, I just wanted to, again, thank the Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee for their hard work on answering these questions. Uh, these are questions that have been raised a couple of years ago in the community um, about whether or not we could build on the Fort River, uh, the current Fort River Elementary School site. And it was a request that was put by the school committee to town meeting at the time uh, to appropriate the funds for this feasibility study. And so we are really grateful that this study has been done uh, and that has been presented uh, in the way that it has. Um, this committee has been has done an incredible job with that. Uh, I want to thank Chair Salvin for uh, stepping in and leading the conversation. Uh, they've been steadfast. They've been thorough. Uh, we really appreciate the care and dedication that's been shown on this. And as a reminder to folks who've been following along on this topic, the Amherst School Committee heard a brief summary of this report a few months ago. Um, it was just part of a milestone of understanding kind of where we were, uh, but have waited for the committee and the NTSKP to finalize the details and prepare a public report which was part of their stated mission. So I just wanted to remind folks also before we begin that uh, while we don't have a planned project yet, uh, and there's no votes that are planned on this item tonight, this report will be helpful to the town council and the community when we receive state funding and are ready to move forward with either a renovation or a new building project. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Salvin. I don't know if there's anything that you want to say or uh, President Griesmer. Um, let me also say we thank the uh, committee that did this. It's a very, very significant piece of work and provides a lot of rich information that I think we can all use going forward, uh, particularly because you also dealt with the zero energy building issues, which is something that I know several of us are quite interested in in terms of how we implement that in this town. Um, I will remind the council, we are also not making a vote. We are doing this because we felt it was only appropriate for us to hear this report if the school committee had already heard it or to hear it jointly with the school committee. We hope we can find more ways to better utilize everybody's time in these kinds of meetings. We look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, President Griesmer. Chair Salvin, would you like to... Just, I'm sorry, a reminder to, uh, to please make sure that the mic is on, so you have to make sure that the bright green light is on, so just press the button. There we go. Okay, thank Mostly you. Mostly I'd like to introduce our design team. Richard is uh, walked to the back. Uh, this is Richard Seepick from a TSKP and Jesse Sailor, Sailor from TSKP. They've, they've done a wonderful job working with us over 
the course of, for them, uh, about a year and a half, and for, for the committee itself, almost two years now. So with that, I will let them uh, take on the task of making the presentation this evening. Okay. Thank you. And just a reminder to please make sure that your mic is on as well. Um, thank you. So I'm going to, before uh, you begin, I just want to say for the, both the council and the committee that we, um, we have a lot of slides in this deck and we don't have a lot of time on this uh, item for the agenda. We, we tried to make enough time so that we could hear the presentation, uh, but also to allow enough time for the council and the committee to uh, ask their questions and to have a discussion. So with that in mind, I'll just turn that over to you. Thank you very much. For the record, my name is Richard Sifek. I'm a registered architect in Massachusetts as well as in Connecticut. With me is my associate, Jesse Saylor. He's also a registered architect. Um, we, our office is, we have offices in uh, Hartford and in Boston. The two of us happen to be from the Hartford office. However, both of us have had MSBA experience, MSBA meaning the Massachusetts School Building Authority. That's the agency that funds uh, school projects in Massachusetts, although this is not an MSBA project, nevertheless, it comes into play when we talk about net costs uh, to the town. So we're pleased to uh, submit to the committee this evening uh, our full uh, and final feasibility study. The document looks like this. It's about 600 pages. We gave, uh, I believe, three copies uh, to the chairman of the committee. He will have them available for the public at certain locations. And I believe the committee will also have uh, electronic version of the report available. It will be posted on a website and that link will be provided uh, by the committee. Yes, there's uh, quite a number of slides here. I will try to uh, move uh, quickly through them. I will try to make the point um, succinctly and then we can certainly answer any questions. If I have to come back to a slide, we can certainly do that. So uh, quite a number of people were involved uh, in, the, in this study. As you can see, this slide shows the members of the uh, Feasibility Committee, uh, and it included also Dr. Morris, Superintendent of Amherst Public Schools. We also have included uh, quite a number of consultants, as you can see uh, on this slide. Uh, in addition to our firm, which is an architectural firm, we also had a sustainability consultant, independent cost estimator, a mechanical engineer who went through the existing Fort River School, structural engineers who evaluated site and civil engineers. On top of that, the town had other studies that were done, which we have incorporated into the study as an appendix for the public to be able to review. And th that material was prepared by a geotechnical engineer who evaluated the site from a structural standpoint uh, and, a, and the ground standpoint. Also, we had an accessibility report, an ADA compliance report that was done. Uh, a site survey was done. Um, there was an industrial hygienist involved who can evaluated the air quality, a roofing consultant who evaluated the condition of the existing roof. Oh, and by the way, another independent cost estimator because we wanted to make sure that there were two estimates that were done and then we were able to reconcile those costs. That reconciliation is now part of the report. Basically, there were two questions we tried to answer in this report. The first question that we kept hearing, is this site buildable? You will see by the end of this report that yes, the site is buildable. The second question is a little bit more complicated. What are the options? There are many options. And the factors that contribute to those options are uh, the population that you anticipate, the kinds of uh, activities on the site, what kind of energy systems you want to use. All of those factors were taken into account and so we ended up with quite a number of options, as you will be able to see in a few minutes. This is the site of the existing Fort River School. The north direction is to the left. At the bottom of the slide is Southeast Street. At the top of the slide, you see a wooded area, a wetland area, 
the Fort River itself, which runs north-south uh, inside those woods. Uh, but I would like you to keep an eye on that ball field that's located just below the uh, tree area. Uh, I'm going to go to the next slide, which is an, a diagram that illustrates um, the flood zone in this region. Now, when we did the investigation, we found that a portion of the site is in the flood zone. However, according to mapping information in the town, that flood zone needs to be remapped and it needs to be confirmed. Uh, we believe that the flood zone has changed. Uh, if you look at that tan area in that diagram, you can see that there right now is a baseball field in that location. That has not been wetlands or flood zone in many, many years because of the change in the topography. So there has been mapping that has been done redefining the flood zone, and right now that flood zone should follow that tree line. That is in process right now. Our study was based on the assumption that that flood zone will be corrected. Now, one of the things that came up in earlier presentations before the public was the comment that there's no point in building on the site. The site school building was built on a swamp. It's not a swamp. Historically, this was farmland. It has changed over time, but it is possible to build on the site. And when we first looked at the site, we knew that it was in a riverbed area, but that didn't frighten us. We've built buildings in riverbed areas before. There are techniques that can be used. Uh, you can even use caissons if necessary or pilings if necessary to build a building in a, a, um, a riverbed area. So the geotechnical information became critical, and the results of that information, the geotechnical investigation was that you don't even need piles or caissons. It's very easy to build on the site using conventional spread footings. In fact, the existing building, which has been here, since 1972 is built on conventional spread footings. It's not unusual foundations. The same technique can be used for a one-story building going forward. A two-story building may require some additional reinforcement of the ground, or, and that's achievable, and that's incorporated into the costs in the option that looked at a two-story variation in this study. If, if you look at the um, Details that we were able to obtain, there are record drawings of the existing building. That diagram on the left is an excerpt from the original drawings. You can see that these are just conventional uh, spread footings. They're four feet deep. Uh, you can see that there's slab with compacted gravel underneath it. What's interesting here for us was that there was no vapor barrier installed under the slab in the existing building. That's not unusual. This was 1972, for heaven's sakes. That's not what we would do today. Today, we would definitely build a non-permeable membrane under such a slab, and we would do other things as well. We would do curtain drains around the foundation of the building to make sure that there's proper drainage. There has been discussion in the public about, well, there's moisture migrating through the slab, coming through the slab, and causing a problem. That if you look at boxes that were stored on the slab in the existing building, you can see there's moisture underneath the, the, the boxes. I'm not so sure. Remember that the building is also not ventilated, and that this diagram illustrates very inexpensive, cheap construction that did not include insulation underneath the slab. So there's a thermal bridge there. You have a very cold slab, and in humid conditions, you can have condensation on the surface of the floor. Consequently, I believe that's very likely that it's not moisture migrating through the slab, but rather it's condensation occurring on the, on the concrete slab. That will not occur in a new building that is properly ventilated. This chart on the right shows the uh, issues that we identified, such as low bearing pressure, um, and if there's a cost, a, pre a cost premium for building a two-story building, which is the case in one of our options, option A, yes, that can be achieved. There's a $624,000 pre 
premium associated with that, and that's a matter of reinforcing the soils with using the proper kinds of epoxies or cements or grouts. Uh, or option B, a portion of option B is a two-story addition, so there would be a $304,000, almost a $305,000 premium associated with that. But other kinds of uh, construction activities, there's no premium associated with that. Upgrading the under slab, rich harder, there's a two to five dollar square foot premium. As you can see here, not a premium for surface water control or um, additional reinforcement for concrete walks. So those kinds of things are already incorporated into the costs. From a structural geological standpoint, the site is quite buildable. How big should the building be? Well, that's a function of how many pupils you put into it. And so after some discussion with the, the feasibility committee and in consultation with the superintendent, we came up with this range of population, anywhere from 315 to 420 uh, pupils in the grade ranges of K through 6. We also talked as one possible variation adding pre-K pupils to the mix. This chart represents that uh, range as well, 45 full-time equivalents. In other words, you could have half-day pupils if you factor in those half days and, and then translate that to full-time equivalents. Those additional 45 pupils would end up with a maximum population of 465. So how do you determine the size of the building based upon the population 465? There are rules of thumb that you can use. There are guidelines that you can use. We chose to use the guidelines that are published by MSBA. Again, it's not an MSBA project, but it's a reasonable guideline to use, and later on that's a factor when you uh, consider the net cost to the town. So what does MSBA say? MSBA says a population of 465 could justify a school size of 72,742 square feet. However, in our study, we're recommending a building of 85,000 square feet. And the reason that we're recommending a larger square footage is because Amherst has classroom guidelines that are progressive. They have a smaller population per classroom as opposed to MSBA's guidelines, which is more like 25 pupils per classroom. So in order to accommodate that kind of progressive population per grade per classroom, you need more square footage. In addition to that, we talked about including in the Fort River plan district special ed spaces such as Ames building blocks. That amounts to roughly 5,900 square feet plus some administra administrative space for pre-K as well. So, so those are the numbers that have to be added to the 72,742 that the MSBA guidelines say. That's how we came up with the 85,000 square feet. In discussions with the feasibility study, there were certain things that needed to be uh, included in the project. The committee wanted to make sure that we planned a facility that had natural light in all of the classrooms, for example, had good air quality, ventilation, good acoustics, and so on. You can see the list here, uh, including all of those lists, uh, list of items, including uh, proper security features. So we tried to plan all of the options to make sure that these non-negotiable items were included. Now, we, I'm going to share with you six options, A, B, C, D, E, and F. F is the only option that does not address these non-negotiables. F was used as a base example. In other words, if we just fix the building and meet code, what would that cost? And it was important for us to have that base example to compare with the others. We also looked at variables in terms of different kinds of HVAC systems. So if you look at this chart on the left-hand side, you can see HVAC system one, HVAC system two, and so on, all the way down to HVAC system six. These affect cost. HVAC system six was used across the board in every variable 
because it's the uh, most conventional system. You can always do, you can do always do upgrades, and we can talk about that. But this was the most conventional, easy to maintain system. It's the lowest initial cost. Again, it was to establish a baseline for the purpose of comparing each of the options. So as you can see, we've had roughly 145 variables or 145 variations. We chose to focus on, in column A, you see there are 51. That represents $51 million of construction cost alone. On top of the construction cost, we would have to add soft costs such as furniture and equipment, contingency, design fees, engineering, and so on. So, so right off the bat, you can see that option A, which is a new building, is $51 million for new construction. And all of these dollars represent the fall of 2020, the year 2020. Again, that's a baseline. If you delay the project a year, you would have to add 4% per year. That's the uh, agreed upon rate of inflation for construction dollars that was agreed upon by both estimators. We can come back to this later. If we compare options A through F, you can see this, is, this summarizes the difference. A is a new building of 85,000 square feet. Remember, that was our goal. Option B is a two-story addition of 87,000 square feet. It's a little bit bigger in square footage because it's a less efficient layout. We are using existing footprint. And the percentages that you see at the bottom, you can see 100% new building, 50% new building, 29% new, et cetera. This summarizes the six mechanical systems that we were talking about. It's important to point out that option number six uh, is an air-cooled electric system. In fact, all of these options except for D and E are all electric systems because we have a net zero uh, bylaw, and so the only way to achieve that uh, is through electric and avoid uh, the use of any kind of natural gas. So let's talk about net zero energy. So in the fall of 2017, the town adopted a net zero bylaw and it was amended in 2018. And what net zero says is that you need to, if you're going to use public funding, you need to build a building that achieves net zero, which in other words means when the building's energy demand can be satisfied by renewable energy systems. Now, typically, that would mean a photovoltaic system, a solar system on the site, and so that's what we examined. Now, when you evaluate the consumption of energy in a building, you have to take everything into account, heating, cooling, ventilation, and so on. And you have to factor in energy losses through walls, ceilings, windows, et cetera. And energy use in a building is measured in something called energy use intensity, EUI. And that is expressed in kilobtus per square foot per year. This is technical jargon, but basically, for people who are really into this technical jargon, if you do some research, you'll find out that you can convert energy into a common term rather than BTUs or calories or other kinds of uh, calculations. You can make them all common and to convert them into one type of unit. So that's what KBTU per square foot per year. So a building that has an energy use intensity of 50 uses 50 kBTU per square foot per year. You multiply that by the numbers of, number of square footage and then you can convert that into the total kBTU. You can use that to determine how much oil is needed if that's what you're gonna use or electricity if that's what you're gonna use. We could, I, I don't wanna belabor it, we can continue this a little bit later in the conversation. Your net zero bylaw doesn't specifically say a building of 
energy use intensity of 50, which, by the way, building code does require. So we would have to do that anyway. This chart illustrates at the top that box you can see energy use intensity of 50. The characteristics in that building is that you can use the building all year long, including summer programs. You can air condition that building. You can use double glaze windows, low E coating. Those R ratings represent insulation ratings in the wall and the roof. And you can use a VAV system for your mechanical system. You can achieve that and meet your net zero goals. What if you improve that? Oh, I'm sorry. So if you can get enough photovoltaics on your site to satisfy the electrical and power consumption needs of that building, then you've achieved net zero. If you do certain other things and reduce the energy use intensity to a less intensive building, you don't need as many photovoltaic panels. You can reduce the number of photovoltaic photovoltaic panels. So how do you do that? Well, perhaps your summer program doesn't run all summer. Maybe it's only for part of the building. That would be one strategy take, to take to reduce the energy consumption. Perhaps you adjust your thermostat so that during the summer you have 77 to 78 degrees, winter 68 degrees. Maybe you go to triple glazing. Maybe you put radiant flooring on the ground floor. That helps you to reduce the thermostats and not have to heat the air as much. But those kinds of features in a building of that intensity cost money. So we'll talk about money a little bit later. How does that compare when if you look at now photovoltaic systems? Remember, energy use intensity of 50 to achieve net zero on a project such as this, we would have to put photovoltaic systems on the site and on the roof of the building, the proposed new building, as you can see in this diagram. All the pink represents photovoltaic panels on the site. And the tan area in this diagram represents the footprint of a two-story building, the total of which is 85,000 square feet. And the cost associated with installing those photovoltaic systems is approximately 6.4 million. That's roughly 10% of the total project cost of such a project. What if you do some improvements to that building and reduce the energy use intensity? You can reduce the number of photovoltaic systems, as you can see in this chart. You don't have to nearly do as, as much on the ground for photovoltaics. However, you're spending more money on the envelope of the building. You're increasing the cost of HVAC systems so that the net zero premium associated with a building of this energy use intensity is roughly $7.7 million. That's the premium associated with the net zero for buildings of different kinds of use. So far, so good. We can come back a little bit later. We've factored into our cost estimate these kinds of energy use intensity 30 for the buildings that you'll see a little bit later. There's additional insulation thickness to achieve EUI of 30, additional um, slab on grade, et cetera, as you can see here. Additional um, solar shading devices on the windows, that's all factored in. So let's very quickly go through the options. Option A is a 100 percent new building. This diagram represents how much space it would take up on the site. This footprint would be placed just to the south of the existing building. It could be placed without disrupting the existing school. This is a comparison of the footprint. The existing Fort River School is a tan area, and this is drawn to scale. The building on the right is an 85,000 square foot two-story building, and that could be built adjacent to the Fort River School while Fort River School is still occupied. Option B, which is 50 percent new and 50 percent renovated, this would be a two-story addition, again, on the south side of the building, and then we would remove a portion of the existing Fort River School, and we would also open up that central area of the building. If you visit the building now, you'll see that the building has um, the media center, the library, right in the center. And remember, one of the goals 
of the Feasibility Committee was let's get natural light into all of the classrooms. And so what we did is we uh, recommended that we remove that media center, place it elsewhere in the addition of the proposed new building, and then get daylight into each and every space within the footprint of the building. That's achievable. So the tan area represents areas of the building that would be removed, and the gray would be renovated. The blue is new. This is option B. Option C, which is 29% new, places a new footprint of the building on the north side of the building. We wanted to see how that might play out. This is actually a very difficult portion of the site, but it is achievable. It's because it's, it's, um, it's very narrow. The amount of room available is narrow. But again, it's achievable using the same strategy, removing the media center uh, in the middle of the building, the existing building, and adding uh, to, the, to the north. Option C, which is only 18% new. These are uh, additions in blue and renovations of the existing building. Again, similar strategy. Option um, E, uh, an addition primarily for the pre-K wing only and renovation of the existing building. Okay, so constructing such a building while the existing building is operational is achievable. The amount of time it would take will vary. So this diagram illustrates that in option A, which is building a new building, you don't disrupt the existing population, just build a new building. When you're finished, move everyone in and then demolish the old building and finish the site work. That still takes the least amount of time. 22 months. The longest duration is in options D and E because we would be need, we would need to grab portions of the existing building and we renovate it as we go around. We would move people into new portions and then create space as we that renovation is done. That would take quite a bit more time, 36 months as opposed to 22. Uh, and those, that means that there's a greater duration of construction that's taken into account in the cost estimates. Um, this chart illustrates the total project costs, including all soft costs, all furniture and equipment, um, all of the phasing, et cetera. And this works out to be, as you can see, option A, approximately 63 million, down to 47 million for option E. 28 is, doesn't really satisfy the educational requirements. It just meets code. One more factor that we talked about with the Feasibility Committee. All of the numbers I've shown you so far are using the construction manager method of construction. What about general contractor method of construction? Uh, MSBA has done an extensive study of this, and there was a time when MSBA encouraged the use of construction managers. They've revised their policy now. In fact, they used to offer an incentive, a reimbursement in, incentive of a greater share of state money if you use the construction manage, management method. They've changed that policy now. They don't offer an incentive, and they have found that general contractor method is, is actually less expensive. So that $63 million that I just showed you, that could become $57 million under option A using the general contractor method. Now, I don't recommend general contractor method for each option. The only one that makes sense, quite frankly, in my opinion, is option A, because it's an entirely new building that does not disrupt the existing population. You need a construction manager present on the site to be able to phase the project, to work with the school administration and school personnel to make sure that you're not disrupting the activity on the site. So that takes a little bit more coordination, and it takes a little bit more money, quite frankly. So option A, this chart shows that there are two variations for option A, construction manager method or the general contractor method. Remember the 63 million that we showed for option A, that could become 57 million if you use general contractor. All the other options remain using the construction manager method. But we'll talk about the net cost. That, that total project cost I was just quoting is a total gross cost of the project.
so um, MSB also, MSBA also offers an incentive to achieve LEED certified or Northeast Collaborative High Performance School verified energy saving measure, measures. If you incorporate those in the building, you get an additional 2 percent reimbursement. So let's look at the total reimbursement <coughs> rates for that MSBA would offer. Um, I, we were estimating that the total reimbursement would be 64 percent. However, there would be additional incentives, as you can see by this chart. So there would be, for energy efficiency, 2 percent for options A, B, and C. And so if you look at this chart, you can see that the net cost to the Amherst for option A could be either 35 to 39 million or 29 to 33 million using a general contractor method, and those ranges are pretty self-explanatory. So the effective reimbursement rate you can see at the bottom. So are these costs out of line? Seems awfully expensive. So what we did is we compared this estimate with um, other projects that were done in Massachusetts uh, using MSBA, and these are some comparable projects that were done recently. You can see in the column on the extreme right the construction costs per square foot, that range. And on the bottom, you can see our estimate for construction costs using either energy use intensity 30, which is the more expensive version, or energy use intensity 50, which is the less expensive version. Is that out of line? I don't believe it is, especially when you realize that those costs include the net zero premiums that I just mentioned. All of the other schools up above were not net zero buildings. We were asked at the last uh, presentation that we had made, what about energy utility costs? What about carbon emissions? Can you look at that, please? So we, we did. And so this chart illustrates, uh, we just chose three options, A, C, and E, uh, just to give you some feel for utility costs per year as well as the carbon emissions for each of these options. So under option A, you can see we are projecting that utility costs per year would be forty to fifty thousand dollars per year. So over ten years, that would be four hundred to five hundred thousand um, dollars. And so let's talk a little bit about carbon emissions. So you'll see scope one, scope two, scope three. Well, what does that mean? Well, scope one are carbon emissions that are released by fuels that you're using. So in the case of option A there would be zero carbon emissions because, remember, it's all electric and all generated on site. Scope number two are energies that are or carbon emissions that are associated with the delivery of energy. So, for instance, if you're using natural gas, which we would be using in some of the options, like option E, or in the case of option C, where we are, don't have enough photovoltaic panels because your net zero bylaw says only new construction needs to be net zero. So now if you're doing a project that is new construction as well as renovation work, only the new portion would need to meet the net zero requirement. And so you could still use, for example, existing boilers in the renovation portion, which are relatively new, which are natural gas powered, it doesn't make sense to throw them away. Well, that depends upon your decision, but it would make sense to incorporate them if costs were the primary factor. Then there's a carbon emissions associated with that. Can I can I butt in here? Of course. Um, only options D and E assumed the uh, reuse of the existing boilers, which are in good shape, but they're natural gas and fossil fuel burning. Um, and so scope one has to do with burning um, fossil fuels on site. So only option E has carbon emissions for using the existing boilers. Option C does have scope two carbon emissions. Option C is an all electric building similar to option A. It is a renovated building, um, so those renovated areas are not offset by solar panels uh, because they do not have to meet net zero. Only the new construction areas need to be offset by solar panels. 
Well, if they're not offset, then they're using electricity from the grid. Uh, scope two carbon emissions has to do with um, carbon used to generate the electricity that's used on site. So if the power plant is burning natural gas to create electricity and it's being used on site by the building, that gets tracked as uh, scope two carbon emissions. So that's why option C has some. I'm glad you're here. Oh, you're welcome. And scope three has to do with carbon that's embedded in the construction material. So right. some materials are more energy intensive to fabricate. Um, and in the case of um, option A, um, you can see that it's all new material. So there's obviously more energy or carbon emissions associated with building those for those materials. But over a 10 year period, it's the least because there's no ongoing scope one and scope two carbon emissions associated with that. Okay, so in conclusion, is the site buildable? Yes, it is. I don't think there's any question in our mind that you can build a building on this site and you can expand the existing building. The second question, what are the options? Well, as you can see, there are many options. And if you just want to look at the gross cost, it ranges anywhere from 47 to 66 million gross cost. Or if you look at net cost to Amherst, anywhere from 19 to 37 million dollars. Again, 2020 dollars. So at this point, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, we are going to open it up to the council, town council, and school committee for questions. Um, again, a reminder that we are trying to get through an agenda with a lot of other items. So definitely ask the questions that you want to ask or need to ask. Um, but we also know that there are uh, other options available for follow-up conversations later on. And of course, once we actually have a project in place, um, there will be plenty of time to discuss a lot of these different options because there's a lot of information here. So uh, I, just a show of hands, if anybody wants to make any comments, uh, we can also go around the room. Mr. Dumling? Okay. And it's just a reminder, please, to, to uh, announce your name and uh, for the minutes. Yeah, uh, Peter Dumling, School Committee. Um, so just keeping this as short as possible, there's some technical questions about some of the data. Um, so how, not being a hydrologist myself, how, how reliable are floodplain maps and groundwater conditions when projecting into the next 50 years? Like if we're going to build a new or substantially renovated building, we want it to last. Um, and, and the reason I ask is because I'm thinking about FEMA maps, you know, that estimate a flood once every 100 years on a 100-year floodplain um, based on current and past weather conditions. And not to get into whole climate change discussion here, but there's a lot of, you know, strongly held belief that weather in the next 50 years is going to be substantially wetter and more hostile. And so, you know, what can we really rely on in terms of what that data currently shows us? And the other question is, how reliably do these estimates scale up, with, uh, particularly with regards to cost and carbon emissions? And the reason I ask that is that uh, we submitted a statement of interest to the MSBA uh, with a compromise framework uh, supported unanimously by the town council and the school committee for one building of 600 students to take care of both Fort River and Wildwood. And um, this study was uh, limited to buildings of the current enrollment size, so 465. And so is it as easy as looking at that chart and increasing those numbers by 30% to get from 465 to 600? Uh, is, the, is it, is it uh, better than that? Uh, is it different when you look at cost and carbon? Um, so those are my, my two basic questions. Sure. So uh, you can do the carbon question sure. <laughs> second. Uh, <clears throat> but I'll try to answer the, the uh, flood map. The FEMA maps are historical information, and they're based upon um, aerial information. They actually have to be verified in the field. They have to be surveyed, and they have an actual topographic map, accurate topographic information has to be provided uh, in order for them to be updated. And the information that we were able to obtain from the FEMA maps is that it's clearly outdated. I can't remember what year they were done, but they're old. So they do need to be updated. That's why I showed you that, that map. Um, and they are subject to change. Over time, they are subject to change. As the surrounding floodplain may change, development occurs, they are subject to change. And so any kind of substantial development in the floodplain does need to take into account the big picture. 
Um, and, and we've had those done in larger scale projects. Um, but that, I think, is beyond the scope of this. Um, it's difficult for me to predict the future, but um, there is a trend, and I think you are aware of that trend. And so we need to be very conservative when we're planning um, expansion of this facility. Um, anyway, I hope that answers. And my, I honestly believe that there is enough room on the site to stay out of this floodplain for the foreseeable future. Um, Jesse? Sure. Um, do you want me to speak to carbon? Um, so if you're doing a new building, you're really just looking at the embodied carbon because you don't have any scope one or scope two. Um, and for the purposes of this study, we've worked with a square foot um, benchmark or rule of thumb. So that would be very scalable. So I think you could take the new square footage of the new building, let's say it's 22,000 square feet more, which we estimated in the report for a 600 um, uh, population, um, and just prorate the carbon up for the embodied. As for the um, other two, if you're looking at a renovation, um, then um, those came from energy analyses that were done based on the, uh, the renovated areas in, in the project. So I'd have to think harder to see if those are truly scalable. They're a little more complicated. Um, and then the question was, does the cost scale up? Um, I think it does. Yeah. yeah. So a 600 pupil population, I think you could, for the purpose of your quick analysis, you can scale up. You can adjust them proportionally. Probably the cost per square foot drops a little bit as the building area goes up, generally yeah. speaking. But for uh, broad brush analysis, you can, you can quickly achieve just by proportion. I think that's doable. Now, I, I do want to make one other observation about carbon emissions. Our study was limited to this site only. So if you are considering other sites, you would probably need to take transportation into account to really get a measure of carbon emissions. And depending upon where the site is located, that could be a factor. Thank you. Any other questions from uh, town council? Yes. I'm Kathy Shane. I'm on the town council. Um, I'm just going to follow up with a couple technical. And your report's terrific. So it probably says somewhere in there, but I couldn't find the pages where it might say it. So when you've shown us the diagrams that go um, A through the E or the renovation, my understanding is you use 465 all the way through. So you, you picked one size. So does if I keep it at 465, what I want to know is the plus having pre or not having pre-K, other than student size, is there more square footage needed for 45 pre-K students than there would be for 45 elementary? Um, yeah. So, so roughly, you know, that it is there a quick algorithm that says you could have the same 465, but if it was all K through six, it would be X percent smaller just because. 45 of them would be a different, clearly, size child, but. Right. Well, um, that is true, that the square foot per um, student is higher for early childhood, for pre-K, um, than it is for um, K through five, and it's actually higher for kindergarten than it is for five or six. Um, but um, I, I think if you, I can't quickly tell you, unfortunately, how much less the building would be um, if it was, um, K through six at 465. Um, okay, because that, that, that's a good, you know, I mean, I can see as you go into the building sizes. And then the second question as you were going through the um, EUI 50 and EUI 30 and showing some of the elephant elements, I've been in several buildings with um, radiant floors, yes. and they are, really make for an amazing atmosphere. So I was wondering, you've got them listed on the chart as if they came in packages, but I assume you could say, we want kind of EUI 50, but we want a radiant floor. And if, and let me just continue, if you wanted that, does that make it harder to do in a renovated building as opposed to a new building? I mean, how do you get an, that underneath an existing building? So is, are, is some of the, your decision on where you're starting gonna restrict you on what you can and can't do? So I'll start with that last uh, first. So yes, in a renovated scenario, it would be very difficult to get a, a good ren um, radiant floor. Um, it's easier to do in new construction. Um, there are techniques you could use, but it does involve 
at least trenching concrete in order to achieve the kind of radiant flooring that you want to do at a minimum. Um, it's possible maybe to add a layer of concrete, but then you get into accessibility and being able to raise the flooring up to a level that, that meets um, that elevation. Um, so, um, yes, it's possible to add radiant flooring to EUI 50, should you want to do that. That's, that's just an additional cost you would have. But by all means, you should do that, and we've done it many, many times. We, sh we should probably um, add the caveat to those groups, um, EUI 30 and EUI 50, that they were sort of just general, we called them recipes at the time, just general um, items you might think of as being attached to each um, energy performance. Um, so we were not um, necessarily saying that these are the decisions you would need to make to get to that. So they weren't target. bundles, per se. No. They were just, no. here's some pieces. Yeah, thanks. Yes. The kinds of things you would think of to re achieve a higher performance. Yes. Uh, Dorothy Pam, member of the town council. Um, well, I was very excited to see the implications of the EU 30 building. Um, and because um, I've been excited about geothermal being put into large projects. And um, I like the idea of the way the building would be heated. I can't stand over air conditioned buildings. I, I think it makes people sick. And, but the idea of removing the humidity from the air and keeping it at a reasonable temperature sounds really nice. I like radiant floors. And you showed that the cost savings are really great over time. So I think that's been very useful for us as we go forward in thinking about what we're going to do when we find out what we can do. Any other questions from the council? Uh, Ms. Spitzer, did you have a question? I do. Ms. Spitzer and then Ms. Haneke. Sorry, just one um, quick question. Thank you very much for the report. Just, um, I'm sorry. My name is Carrie Spitzer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with the Amherst School Committee. Um, these options show um, large changes to the fields and the other areas surrounding the building, and I'm just wondering if those costs were included in the estimates or if they would be in addition. Those costs were included, yes. So I'm Mandy Jo Haneke for the Amherst Town Council. Um, I'm going to try and get it all out. So uh, the PV panels, I know you said and. The net zero bylaw says that if a fully renovated build, if it's renovated, you don't need to add net zero. So you don't necessarily need PV panels. So you looked at systems and didn't cost them out. But I was reading, you know, as the town council gets towards 100% renewable throughout, even if the net zero doesn't require it, we might still want cost estimates. So I was concerned option, I guess it's E3 or all the E options, pretty much are renovation only, especially if you don't put pre-K in that building, um, which means no net zero under the bylaw. But I was concerned that the roof itself from the roof report says that PV panels can't go on that roof if it's, unless you add even more cost on. So how does that, you know, how much did you, you know, cost estimate how much cost adding PV panels to the roof of the current building would be to be able to make it net zero even on the renovated portion, and if so, how much would that add into renovating that roof to add the structural support since it wouldn't go there? And then the next one is with the subsystem, you talked about the flooring, the slab. And in a renovation, how do you add in the um, the moisture barrier to control for the air handling that you said you don't think is contributed by water coming up, but by just condensation and all that? How do you do that on the renovated side so that we don't continue to have what people are saying are moisture problems in a renovated building because you can't go, I, I'm assuming you can't go in and add a moisture barrier under a slab that already exists. No, you can't. So um, I'll, I'll take a piece of it and then Jesse will take the remainder. So um, trying to correct um, a condensation problem should be addressed with ventilation, I mean, the existing building is not well ventilated at all. So just moving air and removing the humidity 
and then using uh, dehumidification system will help a lot. I, I really think that the problem is, is really a condensation problem. A new building would have a proper vapor barrier as well. Um, it's ve that's very difficult to do in a, in a renovation project. It's extremely expensive. You'd be tearing out slabs uh, and putting a membrane underneath. The best that you can do in a renovation is add coating to the, to the slab itself to prevent any possible moisture migration from coming through. Um, that's the best that you can do. And so that's, there are some costs associated with that but you're not going to eliminate it completely, eliminate that possibility completely like you can with a true vapor barrier underneath it. Yes, um, so you, you were asking about the renovation options and um, uh, going to 100% renewable, uh, which, was, which was not part of our study. In looking at renovation options, we were, um, and par par probably because we have experience as public school architects, we're always looking for the most cost, um, cost effective approaches, and renovation is cost effective to a point. Um, if it needs to be brought to 100% re uh, renewable, um, the amount of, um, the, the ability to get the renovation options to the same level of energy efficiency as a new construction will likely um, make it cost more in general. And so at the time, that wasn't a requirement, so we definitely made the renovations as cost effective as possible within the current constraints. Um, you also brought up the question of whether the roof can handle PV panels. We actually do show PV panels on the roof. Um, it's limited in area. We worked with the structural engineer who had reviewed the roof and found that, well, it's not true that it's completely unable to accept solar panels, but it was only, um, I'm going to say, 15 percent that it could actually um, support without major roof um, restructuring. And, and at that point, we'd be losing cost effectiveness in our approach to renovation. So we, we stuck with that. We put up what we could on the renovated roof. Um. Yes, Ms. Grismier. So let, me just, let me just make sure, uh, Lynn Weisper, uh, Town Council. Let me just make sure I understand this. If we as a town choose a op the option of partially new and partial renovation. And then we as a town committed to climate change say, oh, but now we want to make that section of the building that is a renovated set part. We want to have that be as close to zero energy as possible. You're saying the building would probably cost more than if we just well, tore down the whole thing and built a new building. And, and let me be clear, we did not study that. Um, and, and so I, I would expect it would cost more than the renovation options that we've included here. Um, I can say that much. Can I add to that as well? One of the things we discovered is the floor to roof structure height is very low in the existing building. So adding things like duct work for ventilation purposes will be challenging in a renovation project. So. I can't give you the figures tonight, but instinct tells me you're pre better off not doing that. I, I'm actually quite familiar with the school my son went there. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, the other question is really, isn't there, I, I'm very concerned about the moisture issue. And I'm even more concerned when you say you think that's it. It, it seems to me there must be a way to cordon off a piece of the building, try you know, something with it, more ventilation, more air conditioning, or more whatever, and see whether or not it can be corrected that way. Because I can tell you right now, I sure hope we don't build a building and find out you're wrong. If we build a new building, I assure you, it'll be done correctly. An old building. But we didn't have the means, quite frankly, to do any kind of extensive testing or set up a procedure to cordon off a building to actually measure. Uh, I'm, I'm basing my judgment on many years of experience and from my own observations of what's going on in the building. Yes, Ms. Melman. Shalini Behal Melm, uh, Town Council. So continuing with the moisture issue, um, 
I just wanted a clarification because I've suffered with this in my personal construction. With, between, there's a difference between damp-proofing and waterproofing. And so what you have mentioned here is not damp-proofing, but it is waterproofing. OK. Unfortunately, these terms are thrown around a lot by uh, people. So waterproofing literally is swimming pool waterproofing. It's doesn't prevent any moisture from getting, not, not only moisture, but any water from penetrating at all. And, and we've done buildings like that. We've even done green roofs that are completely waterproof. That's different than damp proofing. Damp proofing is applying a coating that, that if, you, if the hydrostatic pressure gets high enough, can penetrate the damp proofing. And that's typically done on basement walls, on the exterior walls of basements, just to help keep the basements dry. Um, what I was talking about when I met vapor barrier is a, a, a membrane that truly is vapor proof. Now, people use the term vapor barrier quite loosely. A true a true vapor barrier is uh, a barrier that is, has a rating of less than, I think, 0.1 perm, or there's, there's a technical term used for that, but it literally does not allow any vapor at all. And typically, those kinds of membranes have some sort of metallic component to it. It's not just cheap plastic. So to get a true vapor barrier, you'd have to get good quality material that has at least some sort of metallic uh, composition to it. So my understanding then from what you're saying is that vapor barrier is better than damp proofing. Yes. And, and the other question is, if the water level rises, will the vapor barrier prevent water from entering and going through the building? No. You mean if the groundwater rises? Yeah, or the water table, or if, yeah. Yes, it would prevent it. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Brewer, and then I'm hoping we can wrap up the conversation. So, this, as part of our environmental, oh, Alyssa Brewer, Town Thank Council. You. As part of our environmental sensitivity beyond our base requirements of our net zero bylaws, some other people have touched on aspects of this. Reuse of buildings is really important to us, but at the same time, this isn't a historic building. It wasn't built to last 100 years. It's, I'll leave it at that. But how, so how, given that, how accurate are the renovation incentive points you've given us in terms of are they a judgment call or exact formula? Because my concern is that up until this point, I've never believed that renovation would provide us with the same quality of experience for the students and the staff moving forward. But I do notice that renovations assume to significantly improve our effective reimbursement rate, and that's going to speak to some people because it's an expensive project. So. Give me a little insight, one, as to if there is an exact formula that MSBA just says, if you do this, you will get that, as opposed to, well, the maximum points are this, and maybe we'll get them, and maybe we won't. And then secondarily, based on your years of experience, as you've mentioned several times, renovation versus um, new building associated with this type of building, as opposed to, say, one of our 100-year-old historic buildings that used to be a school. So as to the method of costing, um, remember these um, studies were done at the feasibility level. So we don't have full plans and specs. They, these projects have not been bid out with guaranteed prices from bidders. So the best that you can do in this scenario is use professional cost estimators who are independent. We, were to we told them, do your own cost estimating. We don't want to influence you. On top of that, the feasibility committee decided that it would hire yet another cost estimator that would be working directly for the feasibility committee. And that, that estimator came up with numbers. There were some differences, some were higher, some were lower, and then there was a reconciliation between those two independent estimators. So what you have um, in the estimate is, is the reconciliation, the agreed upon number that both estimators felt were, were quite reasonable. The, the actual, the estimates the independent estimates were quite close. They were within 10% of each other, which 
at the feasibility, feasibility level, it's very, very close. With regard to MSBA incentives, um, I, don't know if we, uh, I won't go back, but um, the primary differentiator between the renovations and new constructions with the incentives is the amount of renovated square footage, uh, which relates directly to a percentage incentive. Um, and so you could see it increases the more we're renovating. And I think that's, that's a pretty straightforward calculation just on the percentage of the building that's renovated. So um, I think that's pretty easy to predict. Um, was the question about the educational quality in a renovation as well? Uh, right, so we, we did, um, and we didn't actually present them in this presentation, we could have made it longer. We worked out layouts for all the renovation options to ensure that we had daylighting to each of the classrooms to, to reach all those non-negotiables we talked about. And so from an educational uh, programming point of view, uh, we're achieving a lot of the targets of 21st century schools in that. Um, one of the things perhaps we struggled with was grouping classrooms. We, we were able in the new construction to group classrooms into suites around the dual language program in a unique and, and, and specific way that in working with the renovation, we had to work somewhat with the uh, layout that was there. And so this is something I think every community deals with uh, when they make this decision versus new versus renovation as to what their threshold is for um, working with an existing building and what their goals are educationally. So if there are no further burning questions from the council or the committee, I would like to uh, open us up to public comment, a uh, brief com public comment. And I know that the uh, team from TSKP has offered to stick around <laughs> uh, to help answer any questions that come from the community. Um, I, again, given the fact that we have other items on the agenda, and I know that the town council probably wants to move on uh, at some point, um, I'm going to open it up for about 10 minutes, and then if there are any further questions uh, or comments from public, we can definitely take those um, in a normal fashion. So um, if that works, um, I'm going to ask our team from TSKP, if you don't mind, this is actually our public comment sure. space. And so if anyone wishes to make a public comment, uh, please come up to the microphone, and uh, you have three minutes, and please state your name. Hi, my name is Irene Okhovna. I'm a member of the Fabry Rice School Building Committee. Uh, what? Press the button, please. The, make sure it's lit. Okay, Thank Irene Okhovna. I'm a member of the School Building Committee. I wanted to make a comment regarding how to scale up um, the number from 465 high up. So if you look into the report, um, if you have time, there's a space summary. Um, you can go afterwards. In here, it states that for um, classrooms for pre-kindergarten are 1,100 square footage. Those are three classrooms that are counted in the space. Those account for the 45 students, whereas a classroom for one through six is 900 square footage. So three classrooms at 1,100 square foot is 3,300 3, square foot. If you add um, the coordination room, is another 300. So now you're at 3,600 square footage. That doesn't take into account other uh, specialized rooms dedicated for the pre-K, but if you just take the space of the classrooms plus the administration, that's 36 square foot, that's about four classrooms, one through six. So that's instead of 45 kids pre-K, that's 80 kids on the norms here on um, one through six. Uh, there's other spaces that would be transferable, so I didn't include it, but it's over 80, 80 students, one through six, that can be added in the same layer. Thank you. Any other comments from the public or questions? Uh, uh, please come up to the mic. Just a little question, I think, but I'm wondering, especially given all the things about renovations and given the fact that the building that would be renovated is already kind of a mess, I would want to know if whatever contingency is built in in the new building, there should be a much bigger contingency built into any of the renovation suggestions. And I haven't looked at this, but 
I would hope that that's the case, and I'm asking if it is. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Morris, did you want to make a comment? Although you're not really a member of the public, but... <laughs> I, can, I can wait till it's done. I just didn't want to... Okay, let's finish up the public yeah, comment, yeah, that's, that's okay. What I, was, okay. I didn't see that. If there are any other members of the public that would like to make a comment, please feel free to do so. If not, I'm going to close public comment. Okay, seeing no other for, uh, comments, uh, Dr. Morris, did you want to speak to an item on this? Just very briefly, I want to uh, offer my thanks and appreciation and gratitude to both TSKP Studio as well as the Building the Feasibility Committee for an incredible amount of work. So two years ago, um, just to frame it, you know, spring of 2017, we were in a place where we just had um, incredible amounts of questions and some of them were answered tonight. So I really uh, sincerely want to offer my thanks, appreciation to the committee, to Chair Salvin and, and, and our team of architects. I think there, there's something that, um, that's a bit sobering as well, looking at the information. I mean, one might think the numbers of the costs are sobering, but I think the other thing that's sobering is the need of the schools to be either renovated or replaced and then the number of decisions between hopefully December 11th when we get into MSBA and when we have a renovated or, or uh, replaced building. And so um, I'm much happier that we're, um, we have their sobering moment now. I think that's incredibly useful to our community that we're, uh, that for me, at least from my perspective, uh, we're having this moment instead of getting into a process and perhaps uh, not having these additional information, but also knowing the roadmap ahead is gonna have lots of turns and lots of different opinions as we talked about tonight and there's no building on tap for further discussion, yet the conversation that I was just a witness to around net zero for renovation is one of many, many things uh, and decisions to be made. So. Uh, I, I remain hopeful that our community can come together, uh, figure out what we want, uh, and come and uh, figure out what we need, uh, what our students and staff need. And, and I think the committee, as well as the architects, have done great service to, uh, in that effort. So I just wanted to offer thanks and gratitude. Thank you, Dr. Morris. And uh, I think you echo the feelings of a lot of the committee members that I've spoken with. Um, and I know I've heard this from the community as well, and I see some nodding heads in the council. Uh, so a big thank you again to Chair Salvin for leading this group uh, through this uh, exploration and also for all the community members who participated in this uh, committee. You've provided valuable information for the community and also to our architects from TSKP. Thank you again for taking the time not only to work uh, on this feasibility study but also to present to us tonight and previously. Uh, this document, which is the actual <laughs> Uh, feasibility study will be there. Be, there's a copy that's going to be available at the Jones Library. Is that correct? And so it can be found there if any members of the public want to find it. Uh, we also have a copy with us, uh, which I will give in the hands of Dr. Morris in case, uh, since we the school committee does not have an actual office or presence, uh, in case the public wants to access that. But also there are link. Uh, there is a link available, from what I understand, on the Fort, uh, the feasibility study building committee's website. So if members of the public want to access the full report, they can do so uh, on their website. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to President Griesmer to do what she does. Oh, so Ms. Brewer, I'm sorry. So Alyssa Brewer, Town Council, I was just going to ask that before we leave, which we all would love to do so you can move on with your next topic, is if you could frame for us a little bit and for the community what you perceive to be next steps. Or we just we sit with this and say, isn't that interesting? And we go and read more of it because it's also available in tonight's town council packet, just like you have it linked. Um, and we're just waiting for December 11th. Or how does it affect the conversations we have between now and December 11th? What do we do with this? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I think uh, we've addressed that question previously um, at town meeting when we requested the funding initially and also in subsequent meetings that we've had. Um, at this point, we don't have a project in, in place. Um, and so the questions that have been answered through this feasibility study are uh, information that we are going to use uh, in the event of a, an actual project. Uh, as I think the, most of the community knows, if not the entire community at this point, we filed uh, applications for MSBA funding earlier this year with the town council's uh, support, unanimous support. And so we are waiting for a response from the state on funding for a new building project. 
Um, we should hear in the beginning of December. Um, there will be a school committee meeting scheduled at that time once we receive word back from the state on what that, you know, that their determination is. And hopefully at that point, uh, this feasibility study, if, if the application is approved, this feasibility study then will provide the information that we will need to move forward on a project. And if that application is denied, uh, then this study will sit tight until we are ready to use it. But again, uh, this information has provided very valuable um, you know, uh, answers to a lot of the questions that have been circulating for a number of years now about the Fort River site. And so it's information that hopefully uh, the town council and the community itself can use uh, for a future project. President Griesmer. Right, at this point the town council is adjourned. So I'm gonna suggest that we take a uh, short recess three minutes perhaps um, so that the we can say goodbye to the town council and uh, school committee can readjourn.
Yes. There's no basis for people to be sliding the legs blessed. Right, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to say that. But also, one of the things I wanted to say to my colleagues, but I also wanted to share with my colleagues that there was actually discussion there and rejected it. She said the policy is a foundation. Because the ink actually means it is, in fact, more aggressive than simply, oh, if you just ventilate it better, you're okay. It's not really true. I don't mean it's untrue with the lies. It means actually it's really easy. Yeah, so it's maybe it's definitely. I agree with that. But the, at the root cause, it's not about the ventilation. It's the solution to the ventilation. It's nothing to do with it. So you can maybe say you want to have some responsibility. Right. So I'm fine. And I think we're trying to hold it down. Or whatever it is. You know what? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I just need to say it. Right. And now you've got that. So it should be on. No, I know. I'm just, I'm just thanking you for your tireless hours of. Twenty three months exactly. Yes. It's October seventeenth. Yeah. 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 I know, I know it's a job, yeah. but the point is you went above and beyond. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, Open the meeting back up at uh, 7.38 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for allowing us that recess. And uh, first item on the agenda, which we uh, just revised uh, with our previous joint meeting, is to approve the minutes of August 20th. So I'm going to give the committee a moment uh, to take a quick look. This was emailed to the committee previously, last week. Mr. Dumling. Uh, one edit on 3A, um, the fourth paragraph from the end, second sentence. Uh, Mr. Demling wanted to know if some of the items listed would increase work life for staff slash teachers. Uh, if I recall, it was increased quality of work life. Just I'm sorry, Mr. Demling, can you please clarify yeah, yeah. where you're looking? 3A. Okay. I think these items are numbered, uh, are slightly oh, okay. off, so that's another this edit, is, actually. It should be 4A. Okay, facilities and fields update. Thank you. So can you please... Uh, oh, sure. sure. Uh, yeah, so fourth paragraph from the end, Mr. Demling wanted to know if some of the items listed would increase work life for staff teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recall increased quality of work life. Quality okay. of. So that's one edit that um, has been suggested. Any other edits from the committee? Mr. Nakajima? This is in section three. Superintendent's update, the one, two, three, fourth paragraph in. This is a simple sentence. Nakajima also had a question regarding admin week. Uh, the, the, the question was what were the notable uh, insights or outcomes from that week? Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Has that uh, edit been captured? Thank you. Any other edits or comments from the committee? If not, I will take a motion. Mr. Nakajima. I move to approve the minutes of August 20, 2019 as amended. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? We have uh, four in favor. And any nays? Any abstentions? Ms. Spitzer abstains. OK. Uh, so moving on, next item on the agenda is uh, committee announcements. Do we have any announcements from the committee tonight? Seeing none, um, we're going to move us along. And I will uh, open the public comment period again, just in case anybody had other comments that were related to other items on the agenda that were not previously covered.
So we have no public comments at this time. So we are closing public comments. Thank you. Uh, next time on the agenda is superintendent's update. Dr. Morris. Sure, and the update's in the packet if you're looking for it. Um, last Wednesday, uh, as was widely reported and communicated, there was a van accident um, that ended up with a fatality of a pedestrian. And while no students or staff members were injured in the accident, I just would uh, want to offer a moment of silence that um, anytime there's a loss of life, life of anyone in our community, it's a solemn moment. And so if we could, before I go on further, if we could just take a moment um, to recognize that fact. Thank you very much for that. Thank um, you. Just a little more details on the school side of that, um, that we did have uh, meetings to share general information about the incident that afternoon uh, on the 11th. Counseling services were made available both to the facilities, maintenance, transportation group, as well as to Crocker Farm staff members. And um, we talked a lot about how to process the information because we knew there would be wide media reporting and we wanted to work with students in developmentally appropriate ways as they came with information. We didn't see it as our um, need to share uh, with students, but we knew that students uh, would be riding the bus in the morning and regardless of their grade level, they might hear some things, they might hear some things at home. So that was um, some of the work we did as well. All, of, all Crocker Farm families did receive information about the incident that afternoon. Uh, for the students who were on the van did not witness the accident. Um, and, but we still reached out to those families, uh, both for informational purposes, to offer counseling services if the students did later on perhaps um, recognize uh, about the accident uh, and to make sure that we were prepared for them the next day with what their feelings and emotions were coming back into school. Uh, we completed an after action review process to look over and we did a pretty much a minute by minute, especially for the first half hour of a minute by minute account of what happened, what was the communication, what information flowed where, so that we can make our systems better. Uh, in this particular instance, the communication flow worked pretty well. Uh, that being said, we wanted to be aware uh, and thought of what if other scenarios had played out in this instance. What would have been different and how can we improve our internal and external communication as well as safety planning. And so Mr. Smorland in her role has been working on uh, revising some communication flow chart information uh, because while it didn't impact this particular event, we're using this event um, to ensure that other events, if they sadly happen in the future, they were well prepared for. So um, we're um, trying to take care of everybody as well as uh, improve what we do. Uh, I do want to comment that the Amherst and State Police Department, the Amherst Fire Department, the staff from the Northwest, Northwestern District Attorney's Office, all of them were on site and all of them um, in terms of the communication with those other agencies has been fantastic up until, I mean, including today, where I got um, some information, there was some additional communication uh, from the local police department. Um, we don't typically interact with all those agencies simultaneously and uh, the fact of uh, being witness and being present for that and, and continuing to be, um, they've really shown a great sensitivity and care for an incredibly challenging situation uh, for all involved. So I just want to publicly share my thanks for, for all those groups. Dr. Morris, if I can interrupt for just a second, I just also wanted to raise uh, that the feedback that I've received from uh, town councilor and several community members uh, to thank the district also for the swift response um, and for handling this matter, you know, as delicately as, as it was handled, uh, but also from all accounts that I've heard, uh, it sounds like the information that was shared with the community, with parents, uh, the timing of it, all of those things were deeply appreciated uh, by the community. And so I just want to you know, extend that uh, feedback to you uh, personally, because I know that you were on site, but also I think uh, to staff and administrators, um, you know, Mr. Shea and others who were there also on site for a very long time immediately responded with a letter that was sent home to you know, parents and caregivers and uh, all the multiple staff who were involved and available on hand, you know, not just for the students who were on the van, but also other students in the school and other staff. Um, so really want to commend your team for you know, the quick response. This is a tragedy that I think has been heartfelt by a lot of people in the community. Um, and just having you know, people who are capable and who are dealing with it the way that they're supposed to uh, is, is you know, people are grateful for that. 
Thank you very much, and, and I think you're right to comment on the people, you know, both the, the staff members at Crocker Farm, uh, Ms. Cunningham, who took the lead on uh, providing counseling services for the adults. Um, Dr. Brady was really working uh, with Mr. Shea and Ms. Smith, the assistant principal on the student front, and Mr. Smorland, who was uh, the, um, managing the communication throughout the whole day, um, from the moment of, that we received word of the accident to the last communi email communication of the day. Um, she was managing that uh, both internally, externally, in, in pretty remarkable ways. So thank you for noting that. On a more festive note uh, and more positive note, um, Monday is the Puerto Rico Day celebration. I know we've talked about it um, at um, another committee that you all sit on, um, but it's, it's coming up this Monday, 1230 at Town Hall. Um, I won't go into more detail because I think I've mentioned it before, but just anyone here is welcome. And Chair Ordonez actually will be speaking on behalf of the Amherst School Committee uh, at the event. So thank you again. Mr. Ordonez did that last year and um, was greatly appreciated by the community. So thank you. School choice, this is just to plug, I know we'll talk about calendar later, um, but this issue around school choice that was dropped in our laps uh, early May last year uh, with school choice students no longer, or new school choice students no longer flowing to the regional schools automatically as they had. Um, in my conversations with our local legislators, they've reminded me that, well, it occurred too late for the legislative cycle last year. We don't want to let that happen again based on just inertia and the number of things that we're managing. So just a placeholder. Um, Comandante's program is off to a very strong start, and the first of several parent guardian information sessions will be held tomorrow night uh, with child care provided, and the idea is that children would have an activity and the adults can go off and ask questions and learn more about the program their children are having. So it's a nice model of um, making sure that child care or other things like that aren't barriers for families to come in and, and be connected with both their colleagues, colleague parents, as well as the, um, the staff members. You can see the open house dates um, for Wildwood, Fort River, and Crocker Farm. Uh, I think I'll briefly note one question I get a lot is why don't we all do them on the same night? Um, so there's two answers. Uh, one's a little more pressing than the other, but we do have families who have children at both elementary schools because one child's in a specialized program, the other is not. If you go way back historically, even seven, eight years ago, we did have all the open houses or curriculum nights on the same night, which made fam some families have to choose one school versus another. And so we don't want to do that, so that's why they're on other nights. I also hear it's easier to get childcare. When the whole town was doing open house on one night for the elementary schools, it created log jam. So the first one's certainly more important, but we have actually gotten feedback on the second one as well. Now that students come, that's probably less of an issue, but it still may be an issue for some. Um, gardening update, so Jennifer Reese, who's our science and garden coordinator, was ordered, awarded a teacher champion award from Project Bread. They had a big event in late August in um, Boston. And I want to thank Ms. Reese for all of her work um, as we expand the garden program um, to a new grade level each year. And it's, it's um, get a lot of people interested in that, both in and outside our community. And Chef Sam and, and Farmer Leela said the, the students call her. Uh, they're a great work. And one of the nice things at Crocker Farm that um, Last Wednesday was that students couldn't go outside for recess because it was the, the scene of the accident was too visible um, and the, the number of emergency personnel first responders was high. But she happened to be there and actually from the back, from where the gardens are at Crocker Farm, students were able to go outside and do gardening. And um, yeah, I'll just say the juxtaposition was striking because we, you know, Mr. Shea and I walked outside to make sure that if students went out to garden, they couldn't see the, the accident scene. And for students to go outside on a day like that and, and do that was just wonderful. And that's just a small window into their work, but uh, one that's etched in my mind at the moment. So the Grade Span Advisory Board, which is studying the educational viability of having sixth grade um, students educated at the middle school, will have its first fall meeting on Monday. Ooh, the agenda did not get a... Oh, no, I did get a touch on the next page. I'm sorry. Um, and so at the next meeting, I think tentatively, I'd love to give a more full update of the, where that process is and where, how the work is going. Uh, second to last, second last one printed, but I have one more I want to share. There's a report card visions last spring and summer. Um, there was team to teachers under the leadership of curriculum coordinator Tim Sheehan, met to review and align the elementary report cards with the revised state standards. Uh, the report cards hadn't been revised in my 19 years in the district, um, and so you can imagine that the standards have went through many versions since then. We had a couple grade levels uh, pilot some variations on that and get feedback last year. There was one grade level at Wildwood, uh, two grade levels at Wildwood that were involved in that work, so we did district-wide work. Uh, Mr. Sheen is now going to each school, two I think are 
done and to include Pelham in this work to go to get additional feedback. So for families um, and guardians, they will see new report cards that um, both are connected to the educational standard, academic standards in Massachusetts to give better feedback to families and also have a better accessibility quotient. As we say, our current ones, uh, we get a lot of feedback that there, there's a lot of ratings and families don't always have a great sense of what they mean in terms of the in, how their students are actually doing. And so I'm really excited about that work and that's something certainly we could bring back as well later in the year. And lastly, um, I think last month I talked a little bit about the UMass, uh, following up on the UMass, the Donahue Institute study from last year and students in tax exempt housing. So I had that meeting in the summer. Um, the town manager updated uh, about a week ago the town council that they're still in negotiations. This is not a tremendous amount to share, but um, they are, um, there's not, they're not at a point of resolution yet. Um, I'm hoping certainly before the budget cycle starts in December and January, we have a little better sense of what the implications might be for us um, as, a as that process resolves, but I'll just keep the committee updated. Uh, the town manager is very good at keeping me updated on that, and I know it's of high interest to the committee. It's a lot of conversation over many, many years, actually, on this topic, but right now it's part of a larger negotiation that's not complete. Any questions or comments for Dr. Morris, Mr. Nakajima, and Ms. Spitzer, and Mr. Demling? Yeah, I just wanted to ask and comment on this. The last time we met, um, I think, we talked a lot about enrollment, and I just wanted to know if there was any update to that. Sure, there is. So uh, we're at 39 students in the program. So each class has 11 students who um, are self, family self-identified as English speaking, as we uh, discussed. And uh, one class has nine, and one class has eight students who are either Spanish speaking or identified, self-identified as bilingual. And so that's, um, we're pretty pleased with those percentages uh, for the first year in. Um, again, um, 17 of 18 families who identified as having children who are either bilingual or Spanish speaking are part of the program. So from a percentage, that's um, frankly above what we thought we'd hit. And so we're really pleased with uh, the work of Ms. Richardson, Ms. Chamberlain, and staff members who did all that outreach. Um, so that's, that's where the numbers sit at the moment. I'm sorry, does this relate to directly to the, okay, so Ms. McDonald. So um, my question actually was also about the Caminantes program, but more actually um, the kindergarten cohort at Fort River that's not part of the Caminantes program. I've heard sort of different sort of com comments about the size of that and composition of that group. So I was wondering if we, tonight and ongoing, if we can have updates of that and how they're building community with that group as well. Sure. So there's 14 students in that cohort, and if you go all the way back to when we started talking about this, the recommendation from other districts is to keep the English um, language cohort smaller, um, and so we were successful in doing that. Um, there were, Fort River did a great job this summer of having multiple events, both formal and informal, for kindergarten families to get together. So. Uh, Formal ones, there were two. There was uh, one in the early, maybe it was late June, early July, I think it was late June, where staff members of all three classes were present. There was food and there were a number of activities that were done. And they also had the PGO, thank you to the Fort River PGO, had an event right before school started. And in between were a number of informal events, which was really neat that the school set up just times where there wouldn't be other people on the playground. So there weren't staff members, it didn't involve a lot of coordination, but they just said, hey, we'd love for kindergarten families to get together. Here's three times. We'll make sure that, you know, we've reserved the playground space, so to speak. And so all of those events were, um, were not specific to the Caminantes program that were, were connected to it. And so I think that was really important, and, and I want to compliment the staff there for being very intentional about that focus. Um, I did meet with the staff. I had um, kind of one of the meetings that we've talked about before um, doing, make us better meetings. So just any staff member could come and you know, three basic questions. What's going well? What are your concerns? What are ideas to make us better as an organization? So we happen to be at Fort River, I think, last week. And so um, I think students are feeling connected, recess, lunch, the places where students are often so bus. Um, that's another big one. Uh, those students are integrated into that piece. Um, so I'm not hearing much of um, concerns about that. I think uh, one of the pieces of feedback I heard from multiple staff members is could we started that class size low? Because they know over time it's likely that things will evil out. So right now we're you know, 14 versus 19 and 20. It's significantly fewer students in that cohort versus the other two. Ms. Spitzer and then Mr. Demling. Thank you. So um, I'm aware that this Friday is uh, 
climate strike. And I was just wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not um, the Amherst Public Schools had any position on, I mean, clearly we're talking about maybe the oldest would be sixth graders, so I'm not expecting them to go out and strike on their own, but um, do you have any plans on how you're gonna handle the climate strike on Friday? So and can I ask? And my personal position is I saw New York City schools are excusing absences. I'm wondering if we might do something similar. Obviously, younger children will need to have um, their parents with them, but I'm just curious about what our response is. Dr. Morris. So uh, our general policy is when families call in and let us know why children aren't there, there's, there's a state-defined list of excused and unexcused absences. To date, the state has not expressed a, an opinion about um, providing more flexibility about unexcused versus unexcused, excused versus unexcused absences. To be very candid with you, at the elementary level, it's relatively low stakes for the vast majority of students, whether it's unexcused or excused. At the high school level where there's credits, the implications are much greater. So for instance, if a sixth grade student misses school on Friday, it's not like they're having to make up course credits based on a program of studies. So I think the scale is quite different at the elementary level. Uh, more importantly, I think from my perspective is that I know the schools are integrating and, and um, many of the schools are integrating lessons around the climate and what we can do to support our earth being around for a little longer than perhaps it looks like it might be uh, into that day so that there's instructional implications much more so than kind of the strike parts of it. Uh, but certainly, you know, I know there are buses to Boston leaving from our community uh, where there's a big um, event planned and I won't be shocked if elementary students are on that bus with their families. Um, but I think that's all I have to share at the elementary level. Mr. Demling. Uh, the, the Grade Span Advisory Committee, can you talk about the composition of that committee? I'm, I'm particularly curious if we were able to get representation from all of the, if I'm counting correctly, six uh, elementary schools that could potentially feed sixth grade, uh, and, and, and if we uh, were able to get CPAC uh, representation. So you're taxing me at the moment. Uh, I'll tell you better on Monday. Um, but I know we do have representation for at least one of our member towns that I'm not superintendent of. Um, we did out outreach both Shutesbury and Leverett. I think we were successful in one of those districts, not the other. Uh, we do have representation uh, staff and families from the Amherst schools um, and from Pelham school as well. Um, but I, I believe there might be one district where despite the efforts of that superintendent and, and me, we weren't able to get representation. Uh, CPAC? Um, so I'm just trying to think if someone's officially there as a representative of CPAC or they've said, you know, so that's, sorry, I'm, that's, I guess my, uh, the group hasn't met since June and it's not a fix. But what I can do is share the list of the members and their sort of associations electronically with you before the end of the week. Yeah, I apologize, I don't have that fresh in my head. Uh, just to add to that, I think um, it would make a lot of sense for us to extend an invitation to CPAC formally um, and to maybe put out a call to the community to have them participate. Um, this is an important question that they should definitely be at the table or, you know, at least parents and caregivers of children with special needs in the districts um, should, you know, be participating in actively. I also wondering if we could do the same thing with the member towns. I don't know what steps have been taken so far. You mentioned uh, being in contact with superintendents from the other districts, um, but it might, you know, really make sense to kind of put out the call for, for folks more broadly. Yeah, Dr. So, Morris. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. So we did put out, that, that did go out from Shutesbury, Leverett, Pelham, and Amherst to all families and all staff members last year when the group was forming, and we did talk to CPAC about it. I just, I'm a little cautious to say they're officially a CPAC rep or, right, so I just, that's my caution, and because I'm not 100% sure, I don't want to say it out loud, but I can follow up with that electronically. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, if there are no further uh, questions or comments for the superintendent on his update, uh, thank you, Dr. Morris, for that. Uh, so the next item on the agenda under new and continuing business is uh, capital request process. Um, so this item uh, is 
on the agenda um, because we have several big capital expenditures, uh, they're no secret, um, on the horizon. And with the new charter, there's a different pipeline than we used to have with town meeting. Um, so for example, through the new charter, members of the public can request spending on a specific item related to the schools and bypass the school committee. So we end up playing catch up after the fact. Uh, it's a great democratic process, but can make us appear out of touch and get ahead of our planning and discussions for capital projects. So I had gotten together with uh, Dr. Morris um, to think about how we might be able to raise this uh, formally during our, our meeting and discuss it with all of you tonight. Um, I wanted to bring it to you so that we could initiate a conversation about the best way to move forward with this. And one idea that I wanted to share with you um, is that perhaps we might assign one member of the school committee to serve as a regular liaison with the town, um, you know, perhaps a town council, but also just more broadly with the town to keep us apprised of requests like these in the future and to make sure the school committee is in alignment with other town leaders. Um, this would involve regular reporting to the school committee at every meeting and notifying the school committee chair and superintendent of pending requests that impact our decision making and budgets and that therefore should be on our agendas for discussion um, and even votes. Um, the liaison, just a, you know, a quick note, liaison would have a different role than our current school committee members who serve on JCPC, and you know, Mr. Nakajima and Ms. McDonald have done a great job with that, uh, but that's an infrequently meeting body, right? It doesn't meet on a regular basis. It gets called um, you know, as needed. Uh, the liaison would figure out sort of the best schedule, the best approach um, to, you know, to do this. But again, the, the idea is to have regularly scheduled uh, you know, conversations in here in the school committee so that we can be made aware of items that are making their way through the pipeline. Um, and then we can coordinate with the town to figure out from their end the best way to make this connection work from their end, right? So perhaps they would wanna you know, have a liaison that they appoint as well to meet with someone from the school committee. Um, and again, just to reiterate, you know, uh, Dr. Morris meets with our town manager on a regular basis. We do have various points of contact. Um, it's not like we exist in a vacuum and we don't have uh, you know, regular conversation, but just trying to formalize some sort of process, because I know community members have been frustrated that we haven't picked things up uh, quickly enough. And again, I think it's, you know, there's a shift in the way that m things move through pipeline. And because we have these other mechanisms now by which the community can bring requests and the town council can even initiate requests, um, it's not the way that we typically have done things. So with that, uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add before I open it up to the committee for thoughts or feedback. Okay. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah. Um, so I just have a couple, couple of thoughts. I mean, one is that um, my observation from being on JCPC for two years is that there are num that typically when you have an issue that comes up before town councilors, finance committee in the town, it, that in which they're obviously, their role is to, to make a decision around the sequencing and authorization of spending, but they don't have the programmatic role mm -hmm. of deciding what's in the best educational interest. Um, so I'm using that example of education, but the reality is I could have talked about libraries and everything, everything would have been exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And then we could move to talk about recreational fields and areas, and then it would be, as we've described it earlier, almost like a black hole, mm -hmm. where it's not really clear you know, whose responsibility is to think creatively about this work. Um, and, and so I mention that because, I, I mean, you may already know this. This may be something I'm saying out loud that you'd say like, yeah, I already know this. But um, I think the town would welcome more regular, uh, more streamlined or regularized process. And by the town, I mean town hall staff and also the town council, because it can be hard. Um, obviously the superintendent plays um, his role or his or her role as a, as a person. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a bounded role. And so I think also what it does is then as a putting the superintendent in a position where he may have to be fielding questions that are essentially um, policy or political in nature, and not sure what to do with it, um, in particular how to sequence it. So 
Um, my point is, I think this is welcome. As as I, as, I guess we didn't discuss it in this meeting because it hadn't happened um, the last time we had one of our meetings. But there was a joint JCPC Finance Committee meeting that was held like two weeks ago, and um, it was held at the request of the Town Council and the Finance Committee, and as it ended up, a quorum of, of the Town Council ended up showing up, and uh, the concern was trying to figure out how to get a better handle on a process for discussing the capital budget um, for major, mostly the major items, but actually the major items then bleed into the smaller items, because if you spend all the money you possibly need to on all the big stuff, then you have no money for the small stuff. <laughs> so figuring out that balance and trying to figure out the sequencing and stuff was, was the topic of discussion. And I think it was meaningful also that in this case, the meeting happened in fall, because to the best of my knowledge, JCPC's like never met during the fall, ever. It always meets, in, it always meets like right after January and goes through like a hard press of meetings in the spring. Um, before, what for used to be town presenting a town meeting, the capital budget, mm -hmm. the town manager and town meeting. Um, what I don't know is to what extent um, JCPC is going to end up playing more of an integrative role um, underneath the town council. I think that's certainly possible. And so the only thing I would wonder about is unless the chair is going to play the liaison role, which they of course could. Um, it would make would, procedurally that makes sense unless someone else is designated. Um, it would make sense to me that if we have two members of the co a committee who are otherwise appointed to JCPC, that um, one of them be the person who is the liaison, because otherwise the idea that you'd have a quorum of different members of the committee all nominally kicking around town talking about capital projects sounds unwieldy. <laughs> So, so that would be, those are just my initial thoughts. But part of the reason I'm, I, I know I love a lot of framing, but one was because um, Ms. McDonald and I hadn't had a, haven't had a chance to give an update on what happened. I guess now that I think about it, we could have done that during committee announcements if we'd considered those like subcommittee announcements or whatever, or appointment announcements. But, but also there's act, the point is there's action going on. And I think that action comes in response to both what you said, that there seems like more buzz around how to engage citizens around capital projects, and also um, the fact that a lot of decisions are gonna have to be made, and a lot of them are gonna be done in a sequence. So there have to be discussions out of the normal timeline to figure out what we're gonna do. Right, and I appreciate those thoughts, Mr. Nakajima, and that's exactly uh, you know the, the thinking behind all of this is that we have so many projects that are coming up and that we see um, a need to uh, systematize or formalize, you know, the, the reporting back to this committee because um, getting things on the agenda, as, as all of you know, is how we end up having our discussions and arriving at decisions about, you know, the kinds of, of things that we're going to support um, or, you know, if we need to move it off to, you know, another committee or another uh, part of, of, of town government. So I appreciate those thoughts. Any other thoughts from the committee on this, on this topic? Mr. Demling? So it, it's an interesting concept, a, a liaison to the town council, and, and possibly also the, the complementary town council liaison to the school committee. And you know, certainly these large capital projects are, are the ones that are, uh, is the area of our intersect that has the spotlight at the moment, and probably will have the spotlight for the next couple of years at least. Um, but there's other areas as well, you know, budget and, and other, other issues that come up. And um, I, think, um, I think the best way to, to approach implementing something like this is not to get too structured and formalized from the get-go. Um, again, as Mr. Nakajima was speaking, I think a regular report out from JCPC, our JCPC reps, uh, even if it's just uh, opportunistic under subcommittee updates, that's always a, um, an agenda item like, like we have for the region, uh, I think would be really helpful. Um, and then I think, I think we could explore the idea, and maybe this is a conversation we have with the town council about, uh, just a generalized um, liaison to the town council and a generalized liaison to the school committee, maybe, and maybe the only commitment of these two individuals would be you meet once a month and you just, you just it's, a, it's a heads up for two groups that are really heads down <laughs> to almost all the time. You know, it's like we have so much that we are focusing on at a really deep level. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I really don't uh, have a lot of clicks to watch town council meetings, but I'm really interested in what's going on. I just there's only so much bandwidth in the day, you know? And so it would be great if, 
you know, once a meeting during subcommittee updates, you know, one of us said, oh, hey, here's two minutes on what's going on with town council. And uh, from a, a school committee intersect perspective, I think that could be, that could be helpful. And the town council might appreciate that as well um, from us and, and not just hearing from us when it comes to budget or the, the aberrant capital item uh, that, that, that ha happens to catch buzz. So. Great. Ms. McDonald? I'll just echo um, what Mr. Nakajima said, that I think it makes the most sense that either one or both of us sort of serve as that liaison rather than creating another workflow and another role and another you know, set of meetings that have to happen. Um, and I love the idea of just making a regular agenda item for an update on, on whatever, particularly because it looks like JCPC is going to be meeting on a more, maybe not year-round, but more mm -hmm. frequently than um, in past years. Great. Uh, I was hoping that, that Ms. McDonald would also agree with Mr. Nakajima because I think it makes a lot of sense and it sounds to me like maybe one of you might be interested in volunteering <laughs> to serve this role. Um, and I, yeah, I think that, you know, given also the, the background that both of you have uh, in participating in those JCPC meetings, it would also make sense for that reason for one of you to serve that role. Is there any other comments or you don't have to, but. I just like to echo that I agree. I mean, one thought is that it's a lot to try to pay attention to everything that's happening on a town council, so are we going to really um, limit this to the capital projects? And if so, I think it's a lot to ask. I'm just thinking that it might be easier to just ask for a person on the town council to let us know any time the capital budget comes up, and we would do the same for them. I, I'm just... I'm just trying to think of the work burden that it's going to put on somebody who's on the um, who takes on this role, because with the JCPC it was one meeting you needed to attend to, and now is it going to be monitoring every agenda for the town council meetings? Like, how are we going to get notified when we need to kind of have a heads up that this is, might impact you? And could we, in some way, lean on either the, the council members themselves or some su supportive staff there to help us do that work? Because it. I, I wouldn't personally want to ask any one of us to have to pay attention to every single town council meeting because of what Mr. Dumbling said, but it's, it's a lot um, that we already have on our plates, and to add that would be a lot as well. Yeah. And I guess it's where the brass tax is, right? Like you get to the point where those details uh, come up. Uh, you know, I think from, from my thinking, and this is, again, the reason for bringing it to the committee, um, the idea is not that you would have necessarily somebody paying attention to every item issue that the town council deals with, because like you said, there are a lot of items. Um, and instead, you know, to really just formalize what is sort of standard procedure now, um, you know, we, we will update each other as needed, you know, and uh, whether a superintendent is talking to town manager or, you know, occasionally I will be in touch with the president of the town council if there's an issue that's coming up uh, that we need to just, you know, make sure that people know about. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it feels a little ad hoc and, and uh, formalizing it in some way means hopefully that things don't fall through the cracks. But I agree with you that we don't want to add an onerous burden on people. So. If, you know, if we could set something up that allows for just a quick you know, meeting or perhaps even just an email exchange of you know, sharing, hey, these are a list of topics that we've discussed that we think will impact or that we really need the school committee to engage on and vice versa, that that could work. Mr. Nakajima, did you have some? Yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, a couple of things. I mean, one, um, I think the, as members of the JCPC, we've already had outreach members of the town council who've essentially been using us as members of that committee in lieu of any like identified process to talk about capital projects. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's already happening. And so sort of acknowledging that it's happening and also, I don't want to say validating in any funny way, but sort of like saying, if you have that conversation, you can have that conversation and then say, well, here's our process. Here's when we have our next meeting. And then bring, advise the chair and bring it back to the, the meeting. Make, makes more sense than having sort of an ad hoc flow, mm -hmm. even from the other side of like, you know, when I had the outreach about, about a capital issue, um, it was sort of like, well, I talked to you because you're on JCPC, but you know what I mean? Like, I didn't yeah. even know if I should be, but what the heck, I called you. And I'm like, all right. And I felt the same way, sort of like, all right, well, I'll listen. And um, the other thing is, I actually think that the sense I got, I don't know what Ms. McDonald's thoughts on this are, but I, the sense I got from the meeting the other day is there are going to be either town council as a whole discussions, finance committee discussions, 
or even just sort of ad hoc people, counselors, like sitting at home and thinking about um, the, the, the capital budget in like super active ways over the next 12 to 18 months in ways that if the school committee is in fact not actively trying to reach out, not necessarily find out what's on your agenda next week, but more like, what are you guys doing? How are you thinking about this? How are you getting organized? Then, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I mentioned this at a different committee around the different committee's capital needs, but still educational. Um, but uh, if we're not engaged in these conversations and able to bring them back and usefully engage the school committee on them, we're gonna get lost in the shuffle, not because anyone means it to happen, but because there's just such a crusher of pressure to try to figure out how to get a sense of a capital budget and move things forward that that's going to, it's, I mean, that's the, felt, that's the feeling I got from the JCPC meeting, and the, the counselors have so much work to do in such a crush of meetings that without ever, anyone ever intending it to happen, we could, we could find ourselves a week or two behind events before anyone thinks, oh, wait a minute, we gotta get you up to speed on this, I'm sorry. And so I think it's actually, to me, less about what's on the agenda next week than trying to have a better handle on how is the town council planning this stuff out? How are they thinking about it? How are they thinking of the next, eight weeks, and then how do, how do we make sure our committee's properly engaged? Great, so I'm, I'm hearing more or less a consensus that this is a good idea. Um, is there, do one of you want to volunteer to play this role? <sighs> Not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I can. Mr. Nakajima, yeah, okay. I think I can. Great, um, so if, that's, if the committee agrees, um, well, Mr. Nakajima, you will serve as our liaison to town government and town council for the purposes of uh, capital projects and to keep us updated. And what I would like to do then is on future agendas, every agenda is to add a capital projects update um, and then you know, understanding that that may also be other items that sure. you know, the school committee needs to be apprised of. Okay. Great. <laughs> I just I needed to say that on microphone, I realized. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm hopeful that this can help improve the experience for all of us uh, and also for our community so that they are not uh, continuously frustrated by our lack of communication. Uh, okay, so moving us along. Um, to the next item on the agenda is a Crocker Farm expansion study, and uh, we just identified this as a topic. Uh, the superintendent was going to give a, a quick update, but I just wanted to stress uh, that this is an item that was formally brought forth to the JCPC and the town by members of the community in March, so much sort of what we were just talking about, and subsequently recommended and voted on by the JCPC and town council this summer. Um, so the you know, school committee's involvement uh, was actually formally requested at our public meeting last month when we had uh, you know, the people who had actually applied initially uh, for this study to be done uh, appear before us and, and request our help. Um, so Dr. Morris has since been in touch with the town's procurement officer uh, who has prepared a draft timeline and proposed action plan which was circulated to the committee um, as part of our packet this past week and it's for information and feedback. So with that, uh, Dr. Morris, I just wanted, and just to clarify, this is just an update. There's no vote from us tonight or anything like that. Uh, it's basically just information, and I believe Mr. Delaney is here to answer any questions from the committee as well. Mr. Delaney, if you want to come to the front, please. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so very briefly, um, town manager and I asked um, Mr. Delaney to draft an expansion feasibility st study proposed timeline. And this is looking about the potential of it, uh, what it would take, uh, both financially and what it would look like architecturally, if Carker Farm was expanded uh, as part of, um, as an offset, uh, perhaps, of an MSBA proposal. If you remember last year, this is one of the potential options that I presented to the committee and the community is uh, a ways to get to 600 students for a new or renovated school. And so I want to thank Mr. Delaney for his work on this. Um, you may note when the timeline, uh, when the study is published, uh, one of the requests that was made um, over the summer was for me to reach out to the MSPA and said, inform them that the study was, was funded by the town and try to get a sense of when uh, completion would be helpful. Um, well, actually, there was two questions. I apologize. One was, should we get this done? Should we try to get the study done before the MSBA makes a decision? Would it have any impact or bearing on the MSBA's decision of accepting the town into the study in December? And um, if the answer was no to that question, 
when would be a good time to complete the study? And so the answer was no, that it would not have a bearing on the MSBA's acceptance or lack thereof of our statement of interest. So the need to have it done in December from the MSBA's point of view, it was a non-issue for them, it had no impact. However, they did think it would be, they advised us it'd be wise if we were going to do this project, to have it completed by the, um, about three months after acceptance based on their process as we're looking at that point, you're looking at enrollments and enrollment studies. So this would be a very useful piece of information to have. So I wanna thank Mr. Delaney for mapping out um, like the backwards design philosophy of like when do you need it done and let's go backwards and make sure all the steps are in place so that we hit our benchmark and our goal. And so I think Mr. Delaney can walk uh, the committee through briefly uh, what's on the piece, it's in, in the packet, um, the timeline that he has and answer any questions you might have on the procurement side, but thank you. Uh, so it's uh, Anthony Delaney, procurement officer for the town of Amherst. Uh, so it's a fairly basic outline. Um, we don't actually have uh, a procurement ready to go or anything, but uh, we've started. Um, so uh, we would need to draft the uh, RFQ uh, in conformance with Mass General Law Chapter 7C which would be done internally, probably myself, Sean Mangano, other, other stakeholders. Uh, we would look to uh, have that ready over the coming weeks, and I didn't bring the actual piece of paper in front of me, but we had started, we would publish the notice of that in the Central Register in the, what, first week of November? Is that what I put down? <laughs> publish the RFQ first uh, in the middle of October, October 17th. Uh, give three weeks for responses from vendors, November 7th. Evaluate the qualifications over the next week. Conduct interviews the week after. Uh, arrive at a contract award by the beginning of December. Uh, and then the vendor would do their work in coordination with school staff uh, to program this uh, expanded Crocker Farm. Uh, and then actually to create a study uh, and with a goal of publishing by March 1st. So, uh, not a lot of details there, I guess, but that, that, that would be the step-by-step. -step. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. Um, so I don't know if there's, if the committee has any questions or uh, comments for either Mr. Delaney or Dr. Morris, uh, or even for following up with the town. Um, Mr. Demling? Um, yeah, uh, so thank you for coming, Mr. Delaney. Um, how do, we, how do you estimate the, the how, my, how long the study will take? Uh, we, Dr. Morrison and I tried to basically work backwards based on how long it took to do the Fort River study, honestly. Uh, with Fort River, we spent a little over two months doing the programming for a m much more involved project, so we thought that we could probably work out the programming in the course of about a month in this case. Um, the actual study design for Fort River took a very long time because they had to keep working with the committee and the committee had to get together and every step of the way. Uh, where this study wouldn't be directed by a committee but by school staff, we think that actually designing it would, would get out a lot quicker and we think a couple months is pretty reasonable. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so uh, um, the comparison and more analogous process that we considered was uh, the regional level looking at the master regional master facility use study where there was school staff meetings with the designers uh, there was a group of community members who offered multiple had multiple sessions of feedback along the process um, so that's a better comparison that was a much you know both financially and the depth of it uh, we're looking at many more options it wasn't just one school we were looking as you yeah I can talk about it right um, so we're looking at both you know six grade to the middle school as well as seventh and eighth grade to the high school. So it was more complex and, and this is substantively less complex that way, looking at one building, one expansion. Um, and you know the number of students is a little more stable than it is with multiple versions of the other project. So, and, and I thought that project worked well in terms of gathering community input, but yet um, coming up with a, a product in pretty expedited format. So we looked at that, um, scaled back from there to what this could be if we use the same format and a more, you know, I don't mean simple in terms of it's easy, but uh, less, less number, the lower number of variables in this project as compared to that one. Um, so that's how we sort of scaled the timeline. And I wasn't involved in that project, so that was mostly from Dr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, Ms. McDonald? 
I think you just answered my question, but um, I'll ask it anyway. So um, you, you mentioned that this would be similar to the approach that you took for the middle school facility study. So rather than having a building committee like we did with Fort River, there would be an advisory group for getting sort of weighing in and soliciting community input and feedback along, along the way. So they would be engaged at that point. Exactly. Um, and, can I just, yeah. and, and approximately when would that sort of group be convened? Uh, I guess that course sort of depends. So the, there will need to be a group of people that evaluate the designers. Uh, the town manager will decide who that is. Um, I anticipate some of those people would probably continue on, but that, that the formation of that group would really be advisory to the school. Uh, wouldn't, so that would kind of be in your, in your court. Yeah. If we follow the same format, we did have um, a small group of staff members, um, and town manager I have not, it's his decision, and, and I, I'm speaking in hypothetical terms because that's actually where we are, not because I'm being coy or something. Um, so, but in the prior project uh, that I referenced, the regional master use study, there was a team of mostly staff members, I wasn't on it, who evaluated, uh, and town and school staff members who evaluated the proposals. And after the designers were on board, that's when the community got involved. Um, so if you're looking at contract award, you look at building programming, study design, and published study, though that's the time frame where in the prior study it was. The town manager will have to weigh who he wants on the RFQ um, review and interviews of qualifications. So I won't speak for him on that front, but certainly I can speak on the bottom three parts of this timeline. Uh, there would definitely be the advisory board involved. So just to clarify, uh, Dr. Morris, so you're saying that the town manager would actually be in charge of uh, deciding on the RFQ development, which is the request for proposals, um, and then move through the publishing of that, um, ex you know, the, creating the, the qualifications that, that would be due, and then basically overseeing everything up until the part where the award is, is the contract is awarded. That's correct, and then it would become more of a school-driven process at that point. Any other questions from the committee? Ms. Spitzer? Yeah, I just wanted, I had similar questions to Allison, and, and um, I think it's really important that we do start engaging with the community, and, and not because, um, just because of this will be a larger piece, if we're lucky enough to get into the MSBA process, and I think it's really important we start getting community feedback on this process as soon as possible, just anticipating that this is the beginning, hopefully, of a road towards a new school um, or a renovated school. So I just, it seems kind of late that we're getting involved, um, getting the community involved, and it sounds like specifically the school's involved. So is there any, so it sounds like you're right now in communication with the town manager and hopefully expressing that to him um, and reiterating that again and again. Okay. Mr. Nakajima? I guess I'll add um, two things. One, by the way, this is a great example of the previous discussion we had about how complicated capital projects and procurements are. Yep. Like, like <laughs> seriously. Mm -hmm. Like, this is an example of, like, you think jurisdictionally who's in charge of what, and you're like, oh my God, how complicated. But anyways, setting that aside. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna echo something Ms. Spitzer said, just because um, one, of, one of my concerns for why I was pleased to see us getting the ball rolling relatively soon on getting this procurement out is that there needs to be a kind of an understanding and a comfort level, in my view anyways, in the public around what we're doing with this and what we're not doing with this. And it's a little bit like, you know, the reality is the chair could have given like a much longer answer if you'd wanted to, to the question that came up in the, in the previous section of the meeting about like, so how does this report fit with everything else going on? It's like there's the short version, which you gave a thorough and short answer, and then there was like a longer answer that could have gone on for like a half an hour <laughs> of like how it could fit in potentially. And so my, my point being simply is that I've felt strongly that when we get to December 11th, if we're in, in the program and fortunate enough to be chosen, I think it's really important that the public understand where we're going and what we're doing, and then frankly, what we're doing with all these bits of information that we're developing, kind of what we're not doing with them, right? And 
And so part of that, getting, getting the community involved earlier on some level is part of that familiarization process that allows people to get comfortable with, oh, I get what you're doing. So, and so, oh, I get that other group's going to be doing this other thing with this information or whatever, as well as providing whatever input people want to put in. Mr. Demling. So that's a comment and, a, and a kind of a question to the committee. So I just want to acknowledge that, uh, so the two driving points about that factor into when this study ought to start and how long it will take. The, does it affect our current or future statement of interest chances and, uh, and how long will it take once it's, once it's all kicked off? I want to acknowledge that there's, there's disagreement about those two points. Um, there may not be much disagreement here, but there is in the public. And, um, you know, I think that that's okay. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is one of, I think, if we're fortunate enough to get at the MSBA process, one of many hurdles that we're going to have to um, jump over as, as a community, um, and that we, people who want this project, uh, want both of these buildings taken care of as soon as possible, will disagree about how we get there. You know, we might all be on team get it done, but disagree about, you know, the logistics. And um, I think that's, that's an expected part of the process, and so that's, that's what we're dealing with now. Um, the, the procedural thing I'm a little confused about is if we're not voting on this tonight, then, then, then when do we vote on it? And if, if I take the implication before that this is really the town manager's call, then this is an open meeting discussion. Shall we just express our preferences one way or the other now so we know where we're at? Because it seems like if we don't express a preference, then this entire schedule can't really kick off. Because, I mean, the first date is September. So that's just an open question to the committee. <laughs> uh, just a question of clarification, Mr. Demling. Preference for what exactly? Yep, so, so whether we should do this, do this study. I mean, we haven't really talked talked about it one way or the other as to whether this is an example of again the previous agenda item mm -hmm. where you know, it's there, the money's there, and the committee has not formally weighed in one, one way or another. Dr. Morris, did you uh, weigh in? Uh, <laughs> so, um, actually, I, I I have some things to say, but I, I don't. I think it was a question to the committee, and I don't want to perhaps be ahead of the committee in responding to Mr. Devlin's question. So, um. yeah. There was definitely a question in there. I mean, there was, there was multiple questions, I guess. <laughs> the point is, but I want to I separate out the procedural questions from sort of the policy-related ones. The procedural, que the procedural question is, um, is this, in fact, ever going to be a vote before this committee? Or if, we, or if once we weigh in on what we're saying tonight, is in fact it likely, and this is a yes, kind of, I don't want to say yes or no, like I'm demanding a yes or no answer. What I'm saying is I think this is actually a binary question. Either it is coming back to the committee for some kind of approval of vote, or in fact, some combination of you and the town manager and Mr. Delaney will move forward on some schedule or another. Sure, thank you, that I can answer. So um, this money was approved by the town for us to move forward with. Um, well, it wasn't requested by the school committee, for the Amherst Public Schools, um, there's a JCPC process that plays out that there's representation on, and so the money's approved. So at this point, it's a, you know actually not to get into the weeds of the tech, you know of it, but the town manager does is the chief procurement officer for the town of Amherst, and so there isn't a school committee vote that is required uh, or requested about whether the study happens or not. Certainly, opinions are, are valid, but I want to be clear that. Uh, I'm not coming, nor is Mr. Delaney asking for funding. Uh, the funding is there. Uh, it was approved. So we're following through on the capital item, capital request that was approved by JCPC and eventually approved as part of the budget, the capital part of the budget last year. So um, I don't want to sound insensitive to the committee members or try to stifle dialogue, and I think that's why I was a little hesitant to respond right away. But I think to answer the question definitively, it's not looking for a vote of the school committee um, because the money's appropriated and the staff will be fulfilling that appropriated task. Ms. McDonald. So I understand we don't need to make a, a, a take a formal vote. So I, I think then that the question is, is do we want to semi-formal <laughs> to um, take a vote of a resolution to support this process? And that, I think that's more sort of where Mr. Demling was heading was like if you know if we don't have to approve the capital request because it's already approved 
do we want as a committee to endorse or support this project and, and sort of take a more formal stance on that versus what I understand to be sort of very much informal support of this process? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a question for the committee to answer. Um, you know, I think it, as Dr. Morris explained, from from my perspective at this point, the money is already appropriated, and so it's a matter of uh, I guess our informal endorsement of of this process uh, by having this conversation, having this discussion. We're offering feedback on you know what the the process should be. I think uh, given the model that Dr. Morris raised before, which is the master facilities use study. Um, you know, that is something in similar fashion, that if we do endorse that approach, that even if we have earlier community involvement, um, it's not something that we would take a formal vote on, per se. We can certainly, if the committee wills it so, we can certainly draft a resolution, you know, if you feel like we need to do that. Um, I'm not necessarily getting the sense that that's necessary, but, you know, perhaps other people feel differently. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, so now I want to get back to, um, it's not exactly the second question Mr. Tumbling raised, but I'm going to offer a variation on it. Um, because uh, be this issue did, this project or potential project came up as a citizen petition during the JCPC process, which is a conversation for another day. But it's, it's, an, it's an interesting and good way of involving the public, but it's also sort of an, an odd animal or odd duck in that it exists orthogonal to all the departments that exist in town. So even just as an example, um, not this year, but last year, there were requests for major capital projects to improve our streets and sidewalks. And the question at that point came up of, well, how does this relate to the trans transportation advisory committee that the town has that's been developed to develop, uh, provide input and engagement to um, DPW and at the time being, the answer was there was no involvement and connection. And so it just sort of sat, even if the ideas were good ideas, they sort of sat out there as sort of odd things and creatures. And so the discomfort we may be feeling around this is, I mean, I don't, I don't know what value was going to be devalidating it, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to feel uncomfortable about this. And, and we're not going to be the first committee or department to feel uncomfortable about that at the town. Um, and it was a decision, I mean, bluntly, before I was ever on the JCPC, it was a decision to JCPC to say, we would love to welcome these citizen petitions, and then we'll figure out what to do with them later, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're sitting. Um, but, but Dr. Morris, the question I had for you is since Ms. McDonald and I were sitting on JCPC, and I know engaged you on this topic at the time, my understanding was that you said at the time that a study that includes facts essentially as you envision ex um, being included in this report would be necessary um, to be included in the work of, an, of a building committee if we were accepted in. And so at the time being, my understanding was it, that, that it, the, 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 it was less an issue of whether we needed to understand the expandability of Crocker, which, which you at the time being said you thought we did, need to know that, then the timing of the item, or do we need to do it now, or could we do it later? And I don't know if I'm, I'm misremembering. That's my recollection of what you said. That is accurate. Mr. Demling. So the, the, way, the way I see it at the moment is uh, this schedule starts in September. We, we don't have another meeting scheduled until October, I believe. Um, so if, if we don't somehow express the committee's will tonight, then, then this schedule as presented doesn't happen. And uh, if this process is going to happen, I like this schedule because it ends on March 1st. Um, that seems like well in advance of what, however far ahead any screamingly fast school building committee could get <laughs> if we get accepted in um, December 11th. Um, and so I, I think one way or another, we, we ought to express our informal uh, view on it. Um, for my own part, the way I've always calculated this is uh, I, I don't see that it impacts our statement of interest uh, chances, and so I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't see the urgency of getting this done before a statement of interest decision. Um, I also don't think that if it starts um, in December, it, it's going to delay the uh, building process. Uh, I'm no expert. I know there's different opinions, but that's just my take. Therefore, this, this sort of hits all those bullets, and 
it takes care of it. Um, yes, it does feel a little weird um, uh, because we're, out of, we're in a new process. And so if I were to you know, design this all from scratch, I think I would probably have the interactions of JCPC and the town council and the citizens petitions and the school committee all be different, but it's not. This is what is in front of us. And the fact is, is that if we leave this item and we don't act on it, that it's essentially not gonna happen as laid out. And so I would be comfortable with informally endorsing this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Dumbling. And I, you know, I just, as a comment to the committee, there was a reason why we sequenced the conversation the way that we did, right? Uh, it was, you know, the capital request process sort of naming that, you know, we have a very different process in place now, a very different pipeline than we've had previously. Uh, and then, you know, this conversation immediately following was to highlight and really bring home, uh, you know, what's, what's happening, right? And how this can skew a lot of the action that we would normally take. And I completely agree. I think that, you know, in the best of circumstances, we would have, uh, this would have been something that the school committee would have initiated. It would have gone to the town council, would have gone to, you know, JCPC for discussion and for approval. Um, and we haven't gone through that process. This is the very first time that we are going through this process where a citizen's petition is, you know, is bringing this around. Um, again, a very democratic process. It makes a lot of sense, but it just means that we're doing a lot of backtracking and trying to figure out how we adapt our approach to this. So. Again, you know, the, the, the lack of a formal vote, quote unquote, does not mean that we can't endorse it. And that's why we brought it for discussion tonight. You know, um, that was my interest in having that conversation. I think clarifying that um, this timeline is a draft timeline, right? Mr. Delaney was what I heard. And so I think these are just, you know, dates that have been put to paper so that we have something to bounce ideas off of and, and work around. Um, you know, that said, we still have the urgency to move quickly. And so, you know, I also am in agreement with the way that things have been laid out here and also am in agreement with the idea that, you know, uh, the community should be engaged a lot more soon than, than perhaps, um, you know, has been previous practice just because we all know that the conversations around our elementary schools and the building project, and this is all connected. Uh, I've been saying this for a couple of years now, these things are all connected. So, you know, having the community engaged sooner rather than later on all steps of this is critically important to make sure that people feel like they're being brought along and not being left out of any questions or anything like that. So I think, you know, from my perspective, I would appreciate um, the town manager and perhaps Mr. Delaney, you know, thinking about an approach that allows us to engage the community. And there's nothing stopping us, the school committee, from doing that, you know, alongside parallel process to this. But it would be great to formalize that as we think through what the next steps will be. Mr. Uh, Nakajima. I move that the Amherst School Committee uh, endorse the uh, draft timeline and proposed process for the uh, Crocker Farm Expansion Feasibility Study um, with the added provision that the school committee encourages the superintendent and the town manager uh, to work with the committee to develop um, ag ag aggressive um, or encourage expansive public engagement and community engagement um, throughout this process beginning as uh, early as is feasible. Okay, we have a motion. Um, do we have a second? Second. Ms. McDonald, second. Uh, so just, you know, a, a reminder again that we had said that this would not be a vote tonight. So if the committee is ready to, to actually vote on this, um, it's not our sort of ideal practice. Um, there is precedent, we have done this before. Um, and I appreciate the sentiment going behind it, but just wanted to note that, that um, this is not typically how we want to handle things. And I think, you know, moving forward, we have to make sure that we are being clear with the community when we are planning on taking votes around issues because it matters. Any uh, questions or comments before we take the vote? Okay, so we have a motion. It's been seconded. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Delaney. Delaney. Okay. Um, so uh, just very quickly before we move on to the next item. So we had a conversation a few meetings ago, last academic year to be exact, uh, that if we hit the two and a half hour mark on our meetings, 
that we would take a vote, uh, and this is per policy, and I can't remember the name of the policy, but it was something that we all agreed we would do to try to keep our committee meetings in check. So to be respectful of that process and that vote, uh, I just want to say to the committee that it is now the two and a half hour mark, and so I will take a motion uh, to extend this meeting as needed. Mr. Dumling. I move to extend our meeting for 30 minutes. Uh, we have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. Any comments from the committee? All those in favor of extending our meeting for 30 minutes? It is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, let's see if we can get through the rest of this in 30 minutes, <laughs> um, is a facilities update. Dr. Morris. Sure. I'll keep this brief. Um, so, Mr. Roy Clark was here last month. Uh, we talked about him coming back from our thorough update next month, um, but I'll just do uh, a quick review of what's happened in the last few weeks. Um, so from a staffing perspective, we hired two more van drivers. We are actively searching for a replacement electrician. Um, it is a very tight market for electricians, as noted, and so we'll continue searching. And the assistant facilities director, whose primary role is to help with um, capital projects, uh, it's a significant part of that role because we know there are a significant number of them. It's posted, we have applicants in that process, that interview process will be happening soon to get that person onboarded. We wanted to make sure we had the uh, sufficient pool for selection and in mine and Mr. Roy Clark's we do. So uh, we talked about that this week and we'll move forward with that very soon. So just quick update on some current topics. So we had um, some issues with bees um, this summer and fall. Uh, we did work with our uh, contractor who came out, including the vice president who is the head of this particular wing of Minuteman. Um, one of the challenges that we face in public schools and, and public buildings, particularly public schools, is we can't use the same materials to fight pests as one would use in your home. There's laws um, and really has to be truly an emergency to get around those laws. If we so chose, we did not choose to do it and we wouldn't have had the kind of qualifications that we would need to. So we use a lot of botanical substances as opposed to what might happen in your home if you called a vendor. Uh, but we are in much better shape. I was at Crocker Farm uh, a bunch of time last week, both um, planned and unplanned, as I noted before. And every time we went upstairs to the areas where there had been issues, and it, it's um, as of last Thursday, which is the last time I was up there, um, it's dramatically improved from the prior situation. We also had a problem at Wildwood, the same treatment was done, and, and we've heard the situation has improved there. That was external, that wasn't inside the building. Some of the projects we've been working on is the therapeutic spaces, both at Fort River and Crocker Farm. Um, have, padding has been installed um, to make sure we're key, uh, all students and staff members are kept safe. On the back, you can see some pictures of the Crocker Farm interior courtyard, some of the ADA work that happened. So this is by the preschool. It did not have, it had steps, it had uh, basically ways that that internal courtyard was not accessible for students who, are who had challenges with mobility or adults. Um, so it's clean, restored, and um, shifted um, so that there's not a step anymore so that all of our preschool students, as well as others, but primarily it's preschool students who use that courtyard, now have access. Uh, we're still sh going to Capitol, we're still short one square bus. My understanding is before we met today, there was a vote of the town council um, to reassign transportation capital items. So um, that passed and we'll take that next step to instead of replacing a nine-year-old bus's engine, purchase a new bus um, to move forward. Crocker Farm roof, um, this is just a, an update. Obviously this one, uh, because it's changed, might more further communication down the road, but we talked about the skylight issues in the past and in conversations with the company, the replacement gaskets are no longer available. So we're gonna have to just replace the full skylights uh, for that and we're trying to get cost and whether that means we have to request again because we don't have enough funds to do the full project this year because it's a larger project. We, that's why we're working with the company to understand it. But we did the investigatory work and based on when they were built in 2002 and, and some slight irregularities um, with the shape of um, the sizing of them, they weren't like your stock, whatever the stock size of skylight windows, um, we we're not able to get the replacement parts while we'll to replace the, the full kit and caboodle. Um, the temporary chiller, Fort Rivers piping work is all done. There was uh, the same company was at Wildwood Wednesday, Thursday, Friday last week, uh, putting the piping in there for the temporary chillers. At some point soon, we'll get to the time of year where we don't need the temporary chillers and we'll return them. And so it's a seasonal rental. It's not like they're there all winter. And come late April, we'll have them come back. Um, so um, knock on wood, but so far, the rooftop units are functioning much better with the improvements that were made last year on both sites. 
Um, but the piping is there, again, fully there at Fort River, um, almost all there at Wildwood, so that if there was a need of a failure of the cooling system, that the units could just be simply hooked up and ready to go. The uh, TAG electrical program we talked about last year to, around the certification, so we're initiating, working to initiate the study of that and looking for procurement on that. And we're continuing to work on plans, options, and pricing with priorities, uh, mitigating the ADA pieces, working with the DPW. Uh, to be very blunt with you, some of this work was scheduled for last week and, and didn't happen because of um, the accident, so it really slowed us down on some of these fronts um, based on the shared staffing between transportation and maintenance. And that's the update. Great, thank you, Dr. Morris. Any questions for Dr. Morris on this item? Any of the issues mentioned? Okay, thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, okay, so moving along, and again, just to, to highlight for the committee and for the public who may be watching, uh, the facilities uh, update is one of those regular items that we have on uh, our agenda, just to make sure that we are keeping abreast of things that are being done in the schools uh, in response to community concerns that were raised last year and also um, that the superintendent has been overseeing. Uh, next item on the agenda is superintendent goals. Not at all a weighty topic. <laughs> um, thank you for the feedback last time. That was really useful for me. So I think I'll just read through them and provide a bit of context and then open up for discussion. And again, um, if there's um, some wording changes that people want, it's fine to wait till you know October to approve them. If there's not a vote tonight, it's still, as long as I have a sense that the general direction is consistent with the committee, um, certainly I'm open to feedback that might not involve a vote tonight. But if there's a vote tonight, that's all the better. So the first one is through collaboration with the town of Amherst and Community Action Head Start, develop multiple models for increasing preschool access for Amherst children in time for consideration during the FY school and town budget process. That was a budget ad last year to com uh, complete this study and that is actively being worked on as of today, conversations with the town and, and uh, consultant to work on that. Second one, make effective practice, progress in the capital plan project slated for the current fiscal year develop a multi-year proposal that takes into account the ADA study completed in the spring, 2019, and if accepted into MSBA core process, begin the process, in that process made perhaps with broad community communication and engagement. Third goal, make effective progress in school improvement plans at each site with evidence of the impact of the plans and any necessary course corrections made based on data collected throughout the process, and that has a lot to do with my supervision of um, schools and principals, to be very blunt about it. Um, to make a connection to some of the commentary from last time. Successfully in implement the Caminantes program at Fort River and have a program evaluation completed and uh, articulate a plan for any adjustments necessary for the 2021 school year, not just because we're expanding to a second grade level, but because this is our first go round. And as well as things will go, we'd be, um, I think, foolhardy not to consider what we can do better next year with just even the kindergarten um, team that's working on it. And finally, develop a wellness framework to guide the process of engaging different stakeholder groups, develop action plans, and begin implementation to improve, improve students' experience. I struggled with the language on this one, and I think that's clear even in my description of it. Um, particularly at the elementary level, I think wellness, um, you can pick out specific pieces, um, like you talk about homework, and that's something that was a goal a couple years ago that we worked on. Um, but what I'm seeing is more necessary, and I use the word framework intentionally here, is how do we actually think and talk about framework and how does it fit into everything we do? It can't be the add-on, like, yeah, we'll squeeze more time for health classes at third grade. It has to be how we approach our critical work of educating children. So um, for me, uh, anytime I got more specific on the wording, ended up being really unhappy that it felt like another thing instead of that, uh, how do we integrate that wellness into uh, the work that we do in schools. So it may not be perfect and I'm open to very, very feedback, but I at least wanted to explain uh, why it perhaps feels more vague than the other ones is because I think it is more, the umbrella's bigger on that one than it is across the board. But, and the standards, the appropriate standards are listed, um, or relevant standards are listed below and all four standard categories are included in the uh, specific elements from the standards document. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, so I want to hear from the committee. I think, you know, again, this is a discussion possible vote. Um, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we hear from everyone. We've had uh, a couple of conversations already around the goals for the superintendent. Um, but I'm going to actually go around the, the room 
here, and I will start with you, Ms. Spitzer, and sure. feel, if you don't have any comments, feel free to skip yourself, but um, yeah. No, um, I just want to say, you know, I wasn't at the first meeting of the year, so um, this is the first time that I've had a chance to um, comment on the, um, the goals. So um, I guess my only comment is it seems like a lot, um, and I, I don't know if this has already been through a prioritization, like um, happened at the regional level, but um, I think all of these are important, so I'd be really hard pressed to tell you which one to take off the list. So, um, and I, I do like the way you're talking about wellness as a framework rather than a specific program or um, item that you'd be adding um, to, to the school year. So um, I just wanna offer my general support for these. So in the interest of time, I'm going to um, break with my usual protocol and actually give you some feedback now as we go around the room. Um, and actually, I think I, I appreciate uh, your taking the feedback that we gave you during the last meeting. Um, and I think that you know having uh, the way that you've laid these out all makes sense. I actually do think that you know specificity around wellness is important. And so my only comment is actually just if we can, uh, you know, have you add um, perhaps after the engaging different stakeholder groups, uh, specific mention of how this gets brought into the curriculum, you know, brought to parent and caregiver, uh, you know, attention or engagement so that there is some language there that shows for the school committee who will be evaluating you, but also for the community about how we're evaluating this, you know, because I agree with you, it's a huge topic and there's so many different pieces that can fall under it. That said, uh, there has to be something that you're focusing on that can help us help you, right, and su better support you. So, um, you know, I think mentioning, like I said, curriculum, you know, parent uh, caregiver engagement, uh, in addition to, you know, the beginning of the implementation to improve students' experience and the enga engaging different stakeholder groups makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Thank you. Uh, so, in general, I um, uh, like the goals. Um, there are a couple of things. One, um, in another district, anyways, we, we've talked a lot and called out um, social justice, uh, anti racism or anti oppression sort of objectives that we have, or alternately, and more positive way of phrasing it, is ways in which we try to. Um, embrace and mirror the diversity and celebrate the diversity of our community and our student body. Uh, and I, I don't know that you need to change any of these, but I just sort of wanted to say out loud, and once we're done, if you want to reflect on it at all, that to me, a, a, a preschool agenda, capital agenda, most specifically though, preschool, the school improvement plans, Comenantes and wellness, all have really clear intersections, I mean, capital this too, but they all have really, they have really specific clear intersections with social justice and um, economic opportunity related um, priorities that we have. And I don't, I don't know whether you should call it out or not, but my point is what I would hate to have happen uh, is, is somebody to read these goals and say, boy, this committee usually talks an awful lot about these things. Mm -hmm. They seem to be silent here. And I don't know if there's a way to call that out without diluting them unnecessarily, since I, as I said, I think they're very clearly here. Um, the other thing I'd say is when we went through the school improvement plans, this is obviously true for Comandantes, but went through the school improvement plans last uh, spring or early summer, there was a lot of discussion within the components of those strategies about wellness and about integrating wellness within instructional settings, classroom settings, school settings. And so I don't know how you're thinking about number five exactly, but when you were starting to talk about it being sort of an integrative approach into the school as it exists now, I heard echoes to what the building leaders were saying, the members of the, of the educational teams were saying back to you. And so again, once, once my colleagues are done, if you have any thoughts about that intersection, I'd just appreciate it. Um, I also like the goals. Um, Two comments. So one on the on the capital plan, uh, if accepted into the MSBA, begin the process for broad community communication engagement. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I'd, I'd also like for you to be uh, taking some leadership of next steps if we don't get into the MSBA process. Um, 
you know, I, I think we've all reemphasized many times that it's no guarantee, even having put our best foot forward with the town council, there's no guarantee we get in. And, um, and so I think without having the discussion here, it begs the question, well, what happens if we don't get in the next year? And, and do we just keep doing that? Or does a point come where we have to really consider some serious alternatives? And that would be a, <laughs> a very serious discussion indeed uh, with the school committee in the town. But um, I would want you to, you know, be the one that starts that uh, discussion, you know, with, with the school committee to the, to, to the degree we want to engage in that. Um, the other um, comment on the wellness framework, um, I'm glad to see it in here. It's, it's really interesting about um, whether increased specificity is good or not at this stage. Because uh, I don't know how you feel about it, and you must have some really interesting conversations with like your principals and other educators. Um, but wellness as, as an emerging, really high level theme in education is, is just that. It's, it's an emerging but very important theme that touches a lot of different things. And so, um, of course, you don't want this to be so generic and abstract that you don't do anything about it. Um, but you also don't want it to be so focused and specific that it's too tactical, right? It's too rudimentary strategic. Um, so um, I'm really interested to see where you go with this, to see uh, what degree you can engage um, your, your principals, your assistant principals, um, have them engage their, their teachers. Um, you know, we have a lot of new staff, uh, a lot of new uh, leadership in, in the district um, who, who uh, may be uh, able to weigh in on that, so. So I have the advantage of going last, which means I don't have to take up a lot of time because a lot of great things have already been said. Um, so I will just echo, I think that I strongly echo Mr. Dumling's point about the capital uh, goal number two is sort of tweaking that to sort of address what hap you know, what are we going to do with, with or without MSBA um, acceptance. And then also, the way you described as you were speaking to goal number five was very different than how I understood what I read here. So I think, you know, I echo what everybody else has said and maybe sort of figuring out a way to phrase that in a way that you described it verbally about the integrated into the entire, I, I literally wrote how we educate children. Um, and if that sort of is part of the school improvement plans or needs to be a separate goal, it, it, I'm not really quite sure, but I think the way you described that was a lot more inspiring and specific than what's written here. Thank you. Dr. Morris. Briefly respond. So um, to Ms. Spitz, I'll just go in order, um, just for the sake <laughs> of uh, my notes. Um, so to Mr. Spitzer's point about it, it's a lot. I mean, I think one thing that I am noting, and I spoke about this one of the other committees, is that um, more than any other year that I've done this with the three committees, the goals are aligned to different elements, and they're not, you know, some years we've had goals that were consistent with all three of the districts I work for, and so it is a bit of a concern of when we get to artifact time and evaluation time, what that actually looks like, um, both for me, frankly, in producing it, but also for committee members who are going to be looking through lots of different elements that they didn't previously have to, both from a, you know, just scale, but also just literally like how many documents can you look at at once. So I do have some, um, I think it's a valid concern and I share it and at the same time I don't really have a great alternative right now um, because I think all this stuff is really, all the items are really important. So uh, I think more conversation about, um, and one of my committees is talking about, do we do evaluations all at the same time this year? Um, so in the past there's been a general interest in doing that. Um, I can say this here that Pelham is looking to perhaps do it quite a bit earlier um, because of their election cycle then perhaps the Amherst School Committee would have to do their evaluation um, based on the election cycle now in Amherst. So I think perhaps when there's evaluation subcommittees um, do some work it'd be, it'd be good to check in with all three committees because I think the scale does feel different this year because of the level of the number of elements that are hit by all three committees is, is significantly larger than in past years. I think um, some other comments, um, uh, you know, uh, what do we do if we don't get in, in terms of the MSBA is a really helpful frame. I tend to be glass half full person, that's I think pretty clear, and, and so thanks for bringing me back, back down um, to <laughs> reality. Uh, I liked where I was a little better, but I think the realism is, <laughs> the realism is, is a good one. I think, uh, I think that's right, that regardless of all the town council, the community has done 
all that they can do. Um, we, need, we just have to plan for both. Um, both situations, I think that's right, spot on. Um, I think in terms of the wellness and the, and the school improvement plans, I think that is true, it's in them. Um, and I think there are parts of wellness that we need to take a district-wide look at. So I think both things are sort of true on that. Um, and thinking about how to call out kind of social equity in, in the goals is a good, it, it's a good reminder for me. I mean, I think even if the first one, when we talk about increasing preschool access for children, uh, I was sending an email to a bunch of staff members who are going to be part of that when someone's on site in a couple of weeks. And one of the things I noted was for staff members who may not have been tracking school committee meetings, I needed to go back to, we don't currently have universal preschool access in this community. It's a major issue. You all deal with it all the time. And so this, this is an effort to explore what's possible. And I think some of that language, just literally I wrote this afternoon, could be integrated in here without huge effort and kind of remind a lay person looking at it that, why we're doing what we're doing. So I thought that was really helpful. Um, I think there's other things I could say by the name of time, I'll leave them. So I, I guess what I'd propose is that um, I feel like I have clear direction from the committee in terms of the goals being good areas to study and I can make some edits and come back in October for a formal vote, uh, taking in the feedback I heard tonight. That makes sense to me if it makes sense to the committee. I think uh, having you revise, you know, based on the feedback that you received tonight, uh, the feedback was comprehensive enough where um, a vote tonight does not make sense. So we will add this to the agenda for October 15th um, and uh, come to a vote then. Thank you, Dr. Morris, and thank the committee for uh, your comments. Next item on the agenda is school committee goals, uh, calendar, and agenda items. and. Um, you should have a what looks like a calendar that was included in your packet. Uh, there are some items that have already been pre-filled, um, and I think much similar to what many, what the committee members will recognize, used in another district, uh, another committee. Um, we wanted to go through this calendar, you know, fairly quickly. I think, especially tonight, given in the interest of time. Uh, but just make sure that we're highlighting the items that we should be prepared to discuss. Uh, just for our October 15th meeting, you know, to bring the committee's attention, the things that I've heard so far are obviously the superintendent goals uh, vote, but also the Crocker Farm expansion study update. I think just to hear where we are from um, the town and the conversations that Dr. Morris is going to be uh, having with them. Uh, the facilities item, which is, you know, something that we typically uh, talk about. Uh, a update on Caminantes. Um, and then also just to better understand uh, what's happening for the balance of the student body, which is another you know, related piece that I heard that. Uh, the grade span advisory update. And uh, a capital project update from our new liaison. Uh, and that already is a very full uh, issue, but I think just to highlight for the committee, uh, other items that we have discussed uh, as being of interest to the committee and hearing you know, fairly soon, one is a math uh, program update, uh, breakfast after the bell, and uh, homelessness also has been brought up. So where we put those items in the next you know, uh, several months worth of meetings is really what we want to try to figure out. Um, Another couple of items that I wanted to bring up for the committee is for November 19th meeting, um, and then I will shut up and let other people talk, um, is our budget planning, just in conversations around uh, the departure of our finance director. Um, you know, I think we want to start that conversation sooner rather than later, waiting, you know, uh, before he, he leaves. And then um, I think the capital project update again uh, will be another item that we definitely want to bring up on in November 19th. So with that, I uh, just want to bring that up for, you know, sort of open it up for the committee. Uh, if there's additional items or issues that you want to raise or if there are any questions that you have about some of the pre-filled items here. Ms. Spitzer. Um, so right before this meeting, there was a meeting of the budget subcommittee on which I am a member and um, Sean Mangano has shared with us the fiscal year um, 2021 budget development calendar draft. So I now have um, uh, at least dr early draft of all of the budget items. I don't know if it's worth me listing them, but um, I could share with you the items that are not on the document that was in our packet, um, but that are on the budget calendar, if that's useful. Uh, 
Dr. Morris? Yeah, Mr. Mangano, what he's done since the last regional meeting, and we didn't get to, he didn't get around yeah. to doing this and this, is he's updated the full calendar with all those items. So, I mean, certainly you could, but I think I, what I plan to do is share this one, like I have done in the region with Mr. Mangano, and have him fill in what's on your document so that it aligns to what's here. Yeah, I, I think I have that. Okay. So if I can make a suggestion, maybe we, we have a, that conversation yep. at our next meeting. That's all I wanted to say is that I'm happy to share these dates with you. That would be great. Meeting. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I guess um, it's probably more of a question than anything else. For, uh, in, oddly enough, it has a point of intersection with the previous comment around budget process, is if there are substantive program areas where we think we could potentially have an impact on, that could have potentially have an impact on budget. I'd love to talk to them, talk about them as earlier on the calendar as possible. Mm -hmm. So just for an example, if there's something you think we needed to do to, um, uh, Superintendent, to do um, breakfast after the bell, um, I'd want to talk about that like on November 19th or something so that we could then have an understanding when we're thinking about budget early on about what, what the, what we've learned about it, mm -hmm. and so we could understand, um, we could give a signal to you about how much we want to prioritize that or not, depending on what you tell us. And that may be true for Comandantes, it may be true for even the other school improvement plans, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm, I guess that's not feedback we can get tonight, but I guess even as soon as next meeting, um, I would love for you to look through the goals and understand where they intersect with this calendar, and then as, as, as you're thinking about things that intersect with things that we're interested in that could have a budget impact, how do we front load the, that on our calendar mm -hmm. so that, because what I really don't like doing is I don't like talking about investments and budget sort of under the gun when we're having to like, we've got to approve a budget and make a decision around some new program area. Um, not that you've done that a lot, but I'm just saying that stinks. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Uh, Ms. McDonald. Um, I think maybe you've already mentioned it and I missed it, so I apologize, but um, for either October or November or maybe both, I, I think some conversation um, about community outreach and community engagement around the capital spending would be um, well-timed so that we're having that conversation well before we get into Crocker Farm Expansion Study, well before we get to the December meeting. Um, and going back to comments made earlier about is there a way that we can start that process earlier? Um, so I, I, I think October feels like a good time for that. I can't remember what else you had on that uh, meeting. Obviously the January meeting will have reorganization. Mm -hmm. um, and the middle grade span um, advisory board is going to be wrapping up in January, so probably that February meeting would be a report out on that. And then I wonder if that meeting or an earlier meeting might be an appropriate one to have a conversation about what are we going to do with it when we get that, right? Like, I'm, I'm on that board and it's not clear to me what the process would be once we have that report. So maybe sort of knowing what that roadmap looks like and either ahead of that meeting or as part of that meeting would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Morris. Not to get into the weeds of, of Ms. McDonald's point, because I don't want to you know, deviate, but I do think um, one of the challenges of that particular timeline and process is it'll go back to the region, um, which is where it originated. So I just, I don't want to get too much into it, and we could follow up offline, but. Um, Let's not get into that here, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just very quickly bring to uh, the committee's attention, it is 9.14, so one minute shy of our 30-minute uh, expansion that we had just added, we voted on just a little while ago. So um, I don't know if the committee wants to take another vote. Um, I know this is so technical, but you know, I think it's, it's important. Mr. Demling. I move to ex extend our meeting it's not going to happen. 30 minutes. We have a motion to extend for 30 minutes. Do we have a second? Yes, reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nakajima, we, it's, the, the move, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, 
Any questions, comments, amendments? Okay, all those in favor of extending the meeting for 30 minutes? Okay, we have, uh, Ms. McDonald, did you vote in favor? Yes, okay. <laughs> so we have four in favor, uh, any against? <laughs> and one against. Uh, so that passes. We are voting to extend for 30 minutes, and I'm hopeful that we can finish before that. Mr. Dumling. Yeah, uh, just real quick on the calendar. Um, I really like Mr. Nakajima's suggestion of taking the goals uh, and sprinkling in topics, pre-scheduling pre them. It would definitely be unfortunate if every one of these five didn't get something more than a superintendent's update at some point over the calendar year. Um, plus one breakfast after the bell. Um, I understand, you know, that uh, timing when that is going to be most effective. Uh, we, you know, we have new leadership in that position. You know, we have to figure out what the implementation is. It has facilities, repercussions. Uh, that being said, you know, I, th I think that's uh, a pretty high priority. Um, and not to put too much more on your plate, but I, I, I would like this year for us to have even just a brief discussion about, at the elementary level, what we're doing to support students uh, to feel supported and accepted with their own gender identity. Uh, this is an issue that I think typically we, we think of as more as an older student issue, um, um, but I, I don't think it's just a middle school, high school thing. I, I think, in fact, one of our uh, principals spoke about this during one of the student improvement plans or, or, or a different item. Uh, I can't remember which. Um, but that, I would I'd love that to, to get on the agenda. Dr. Morris. Yeah, to be just brief and explicit, that's part of the focus of wellness is mm -hmm. for all students, and um, that's a subset of students that we're, um, I think, data would suggest we particularly need to focus on as it relates to wellness, so um, part and parcel of that, so absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I think this was also a conversation we had at our last meeting that, that we, I had raised. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of items on uh, the docket for this upcoming year, uh, which is as it should be. I would like to propose that uh, Dr. Morris and I sit down and uh, go through some of these things that have been proposed tonight and come back at our next meeting with another draft of this. Uh, and of course, this is a living document. It'll continue changing uh, throughout the year. But at the very least, this gives us something to focus on for the next couple of uh, meetings. And I especially appreciate uh, comments about, uh, you know, thinking about our budget planning process um, and making sure that all of the items that we're talking about, and this is similar to what we've done in previous years where we've had uh, programs, you know, come and present to the school committee. It was in that, you know, uh, that vein of thinking. So I think uh, this absolutely makes sense for us to, to do. Okay. Thank you. So uh, moving us along, um, we have gifts. Dr. Morris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if anyone wants to make a motion to accept uh -huh. the gifts. I move that we accept the following gifts from Amherst Education Foundation number 1579 to support making history project in the amount of $7,000. And from Amherst Education Foundation also 1579 to support the Greater Library Access Project in the amount of $3,477 for a total of $10,477. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. Uh, any comments from the committee? All those in favor of the motion? It is unanimous. Thank you very much, and thank you to the American, uh, to the Amherst Education Foundation for your generous donations. Mr. Nakajima. I move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. second. <laughs> uh, Ms. Spitzer has it. <laughs> All those in favor of adjourning. Great, thank you very in much. In less than five minutes. I, I, I think, than uh, and, and do we have any uh, nays? Abstentions. Mr. Dumbling abstains. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.